Geek 5 Station, this is your friend and pal, Dean Alves, for another enticing episode of Wrestling Geeks Alliance, a show that weekly, me and my awesome co-host, Christopher Brother Ray Patton, review everything wrestling-related when it comes to news and reviewing of the shows for all the different wrestling leagues. So, uh, thank you guys, new listeners, appreciate you coming back, um, you know, or older listeners, appreciate you coming back, uh, newer listeners, um, thank you for coming. Uh, we have these awesome shows that we usually record on Thursdays and Saturdays. We try to get them out by Friday, Saturday afternoon. Uh, yeah, we have them for you for your enjoyment, especially in this time where we can just provide you with some entertainment and go over everything. And just to let you know, I don't know what platform you're listening, but you can find us on very you know, like like Stitcher, like YouTube, like. Uh, SoundCloud, uh, so many different platforms. Just search us at Wrestling Geeks Alliance. I'm, of course, with my awesome co-host, Christopher Brother Ray Patton. How are you doing, sir? Hey, man, I'm doing great. I uh, just woke up from a nap a few minutes ago. We've had a, a little bit of technical difficulties here, but uh, hopefully we're back and clear. Uh, how, how's your week doing, man? It's going good. It's going good, you know. Um, isolated in my house, well, with my roommates, which I can say is a good thing for sure. Um, but trying to get through this and, uh, anyone out there that's dealing with, you know, everything that's going on with COVID and, and, and the, uh, the coronavirus itself, whether you're being isolated or, you know, if, if you're losing money or if you know someone that's affected by this, we are here with you and we're here to provide entertainment. Uh, we've all been dealing with a lot of stuff due to this and we will get through it together. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that. On that note, um, not trying to be somber, but we have someone pretty important to talk about, Chris. Um, we lost a legend within professional wrestling today. Uh, Howard Finkel, the Fink, uh, the wrestling announcer for WWE throughout the 80s and 90s and into the 2000s before he retired, has passed away. Um, and uh, he's just a huge stone, I think, in the pillar that is WWF. Uh, when it first started, I mean, I would put him up there with Bobby the Brain Heenan and and uh, Mean Gene Okerlund and and um, Vince himself and Hulk Hogan. He was just as important. He was a part of that whole entire fabric that built up what WWF became. And once they became WWE, uh, his voice is 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 very you know we've I've done personal tributes to him at the beginning and I, I'll probably continue to do that because I don't do the best Fink impersonation, but you know, it's, there's no one that has his timber, no one that has his, his style of voice. Um, and I, as much as I love the buffers for, for UFC and, and also boxing and as much as I love a lot of different announcers within wrestling, Lillian Garcia comes to mind. I don't think anyone will really go down as being as legendary at least with my time of watching wrestling, being within the 80s and then being a teenager throughout the late 90s when the Attitude Era was there and, and going forward, he was a part of uh, a lot of uh, the wrestling. And not only that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get to some of the nice words that people had to say about uh, Howard uh, via Twitter and his passing. But he was backstage. He was uh, pretty much a producer, uh, worked with a lot of the talent. And a lot of people, uh, Trish Stratus and Chris Jericho come to mind, said that he helped them, you know, build themselves uh, when they first started. And they were – he was hugely influential in their career uh, when they didn't really know what the heck they were doing within the WWF. Um, Chris, do you have any, um, you know, comments, stories to say about Howard Finkel? I mean, obviously a legend and someone you have to think of when you think of some of the classic WrestleMania matches and moments 
just from the standpoint of being the guy to kind of start the whole thing out. Um, the legendary voice of Howard Finkel is something that, that's hard to forget. And, and as you've done the impersonations, I'm sure we kind of all have as wrestling fans to some extent, not quite nailing it, but loving it uh, nonetheless. It's very, very sad, uh, unfortunate passing. Hope, you know, sending good vibes to, out to everyone affected and uh, hopefully his friends and family are, are doing okay during this tough time. But yeah, tr- true legend. And I would, you know, when I think of a classic wrestling. Um, I, I guess I want to say ring announcer. Or, um, he's he's definitely up there. I mean, you know, growing up watching WCW, obviously, uh, Buffer is is another one that was a big big influence on me as a kid and one that sticks out in my mind. But uh, Fink would probably be even above that, and then later on, probably Lillian Garcia, as you were mentioning. But uh, yeah, just very very sad. And, and it was great to see you know all of the wrestlers that he kind of touched over the years um, come out and speak on Twitter for sure. Yeah. And let's talk about a couple of those before we move on. Um, like I said, Trish had a great one that was really sweet talking about the beginning of her career and how Howard helped her out and picked her up from the airport and made her feel comfortable about everything. Cause she was going from being a fitness model into the world of wrestling and uh, being a valet. So this man who honestly doesn't uh, post a lot, uh, on social media, said he was saddened to learn to the passing of my good friend and WWE's first employee, WWE Hall of Famer Howard Finkel. Think about that. I mean, you can say that the WWE Hall of Fame is silly. I, I understand that. But the fact that he is an announcer that's in a Hall of Fame, I think, says something of uh, how much he contributed. But um, he, he would continue to say the greatest moments in sports and entertainment history were made all the grander thanks to Howard's iconic voice. Uh, WWE put an awesome package of a lot of everyone's favorite championship wins uh, in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s uh, with Howard, you know, announcing at the end whoever the champion was. And uh, Hulk Hogan said Howard Finkel was on Team Hogan through the good and bad times. Even when I was on the outs with WWF, Howard would call on a consistent basis to tell me to always keep my head up. Uh, it was never say never, and you and Vince will work it out. My good friend, RIP, I love you so much for life, Hulk Hogan. Chris Jericho said, thanks, Howard, for being the best wrestling ring announcer in history, a great employee for WWE, and a good guy. And I, people might take this the wrong way. you got to realize the interaction of how Fink was with Jericho at the beginning of Jericho's career in WWE, but he called him a loyal lackey. So if you understand that concept. You know, that that was their interaction. Finkel was uh, basically the new Rufus for a while with Jericho and great entertaining stuff. Hopefully you'll announce my entrance into the great unknown when I join you someday. Really good stuff, man. And um, like I said, unfortunate. That was another thing. He was an entertainer. He could actually do stuff outside of just announcing. And uh, one of the fun scenarios was his uh, rivalry with Lin- Lillian Garcia and just a lot of funny segments and uh, different things that he tried in the late 90s, early 2000s that put him down as a very important icon within uh, professional wrestling, especially when it goes to WWF, WWE. So um, sad, sad um, to, to have him go at 69. It seems pretty young, but um, I wanted to give a 10 second salute and uh, pay my respects to his family and his friends and everyone and give thanks for Howard Finkel, the Fink. All right. Well, uh, Chris, any closing statements before we move on? No, I mean, I think once again, obviously a hall of famer legend. There's so many of those great moments with Hogan in the eighties that I think back to immediately when I think of Howard Finkel's voice and, uh, yeah, just very sad and and just thoughts and prayers to the family, obviously. Uh, yeah, Fink will definitely be missed even if it, you know, even, even though he hasn't been around in current years, he's definitely someone that always stands out in my mind, especially if you go back and watch any of those kind of classic WrestleMania moments. Absolutely. All right. Well, we have a huge chunk of uh, stuff to talk about that happened yesterday. Seems like an understatement at this point, Chris. Um, 
I think that we should first start with the uh, I don't know what is it called the Entertainment Coalition or what have you. I'm pulling it up right now, but basically, President Donald Trump, um, he is bored. He knows that people are bored within the United States. There is not any entertainment. Um, everyone's watching repeats uh, or or old, you know, whether it be wrestling or, or uh, baseball or football games. Um, nothing's up and running. So he has formed basically a group of people um, to get the whole entire entertainment and sports uh, conglomerates up and running or at least – when we can get them up and running, how to, you know, sustain the economy with the entertainment entities and also the sports entities. And the reason why that kind of has to do with WWE, not only does, well, she was a part of his cabinet, but um, Linda McMahon is a big person that's being a, uh, a person between Donald Trump and also, you know, advising this concept basically. And her husband, Vince McMahon is also included Uh, So the 16 sports figures um, in charge of doing that is uh, NBA's Adam Silver, MLB's Rob Manfield, NFL's Roger Goodell, UFC, Dana White, uh, the PGA, uh, Jay Monahan, the LPGA, Mike Wan, the USTA, Patrick Calbrate, the MLS, uh, Don Garber, the WWE, Vince McMahon, NASCAR, Lessa Kennedy, the NHL, Gary Bettemann. Uh, New England Patriots owner Bob Kraft, Dallas Cowboys owner Jerry Jones, Dallas Mavericks owner Mark Cuban, WNBA uh, owner Kathy Engelbert, and the NWSL with Lisa uh, Bard. So they are now trying to figure out a way to get everything out um, with bringing entertainment out there, bringing sports back as a form of not only entertainment to take our minds off of things, quote unquote, if you will, but also to start the economy within those various entertainment realms. Um, (laughs) I mean, part of me wants to be cynical, but I get this uh, to an extent. I don't want this to be a thing where we're trying to do this by the end of May and people tell Donald, the committee themselves, this is not a good idea, and if that's the situation, that's where it becomes a problem. I'm not going to pretend that any of these rich owners have the best interest for human beings and safety because I know that it comes down to the bottom dollar, and that's where the motivation lies. Um, but uh, if you are talking about trying to figure out everything you know, once we can, then I don't think this is such a bad idea. Uh, I think that it's called the Great American Economic Revival Industry Group. So that is one hell of a name. It's kind of like the Justice League. (laughs) Chris, what do you think about all this? It's almost like Vince's creative team came up with a name because they're really good at naming (laughs) things really fucking bad. Uh, it's, um, It's something that. I'm assuming I, uh, goes... I take offense to that. I just want to let you know I came up with that. It was a wonderful name. It was the best name. It was a long name. It was a great name. Great name. <laughs> uh, thanks, Trump. Um, no, I mean, I, a lot of it is I think it goes back to WWE and they're being, you know, called an essential business. And obviously, with some of the things that's happened with Dana White as he's been trying to run these open arena shows, even if it's on an island with no one around, some of that stuff has gotten kiboshed. Um, I, in a lot of these leagues, like Gary Bettman, who's one you mentioned for the NHL, they're already having talks on trying to figure out how to play out the rest of their season to some extent, uh, whether that's through you know, neutral site games with no fans and just the teams. So essentially not playing in any one state. They would be picking whichever state would allow them to play the games and then playing there. Um, obviously, you know, baseball's there and, and uh, the, the NFL owners, obviously, and um, it's affecting all these sports in different ways. And it, it's looking like this thing is going to last longer than I think people expected. I think they underestimated how how crazy this actually was. And, and I, you know, me being guilty of that as well, when it, when the stuff starts starting coming around, as we've talked about on the show previously. But from, uh, my guess is it's it's more of a coalition to try to figure out 
one, entertainment to some extent and how that looks going forward, and two, what, where can they do some of this stuff? So, like, they, with the NHL, for instance, Gary Bettman, his is a little different because the Canadian borders are closed. So how what does that even look like? How do you even get players together to play when most of your players are, you know, from Canada or from other places throughout the world, like Russia, and, um, Czechoslovakia, et cetera. Um, so I think some of it is that there's not been a whole lot of details about what it was other than the Internet flipping out because you had the essential business order of Vince McMahon, where he's allowed to now run live shows again. Uh, you had the announcement of this group and then you had the layoffs. <laughs> which we're about to talk about here shortly. So if anything, Vince almost became like a marker <laughs> or a, like kind of like the bad guy in this entire group to some extent, um, even more so than Dana White, who's been kind of crazy throughout this entire thing. But I will say this is like, apparently this group had been forming for like two weeks beforehand. So this is kind of just a weird timeline of how things fell in, or at least that's how it's been presented. Um, I don't know. It's interesting to see. I mean, I would love to be a fly on the wall to see what Dana White is saying to someone like Gary Bettman <laughs> and Robert Kraft from the New England Patriots. And then Vince is just there in a corner, maniacally laughing. Um, from from that standpoint, I, I'm almost as cynical as you. Like, I don't think that they're necessarily going to have the... I mean, obviously, they have the interest of their employees in mind. Um, these different teams and these different owners and and how they can pay these players because in theory if like if the NF, if the NHL cancels their games for the rest of the year contracts expire on July 1st for instance this is what I can talk about because I know a lot about the NHL when your contracts expire on July 1st what do you do do you pay those players for those missed games so there's some of that um, I'm wondering if maybe there's some sort of bailout that might come for some of these sports teams um, or leagues which is kind of crazy to think about. But uh, um, as of right now, we haven't gotten any real details about what this group is other than it's Donald Trump is bored of watching old football games. That's what, (laughs) that's mostly what I gathered out of it. And that's a, that's a good reason. All right. Um, Yeah. Crazy stuff. Um, I don't think it says it. Well, (laughs) It could be as negative as a lot of people are just going to assume. Um, I think that it is having a bunch of minds like a Mark Cuban in there with a Robert Kraft in there with a Vince McMahon throughout all the different people um, to figure out how to get stuff back up and running slowly to once we can, you know, try to try to make some money off of this. And that's the biggest, especially like, I mean, Vince is doing what he can with WWF. And, uh, you know, even though Tony Khan's not a part of this, he's doing what he can. And now we have Florida that's allowing them to have shows, uh, calling them, like you said, Chris, essential. But at the same time, you know, they're, they're still losing revenue and everyone else that's not doing anything, whoever it be, the NFL, the NBA, they are just completely not making any money at this point. So, um, yeah, and that's not just like from the door um, uh, of people coming into the events. I mean, just in general, uh, between – commercials and and sponsorships and everything uh this is a huge hit so it is something that we need to take seriously and as long like i said as long as these and this is the hard thing to uh hope for chris but as long as these rich people (laughs) with all these companies have it out for our best intention and they're trying to be realistic about it i don't have a problem with it but if they're trying to get this to happen and not being safe then once that red flag gets there, that's where I'm going to have a problem with it. So I guess that's that's how I feel either way. Any closing statements before we move on to the layoffs? Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think it's more just like what is the intent? If the intent is just so that people have entertainment at the end of the day and how to safely finish up these seasons for the NBA, the NHL, do some of these UFC fights, maybe do some NASCAR events, Um it, it, kind of what WWE has been doing in AEW with empty arenas, then I think this group makes sense. But there's also, like like you said, the the cynical part of me that's like, what does this actually mean? And hopefully you're not just going to start opening doors to arenas for like a thousand fans and then separate them six feet apart, <laughs> ticket sell wise or whatever. Like that that kind of shit makes me nervous. But 
you know, until we hear more, I'm just going to be cautiously optimistic, I guess. Yep. And that's all you can really do in the situation. Um, even more unfortunate, obviously, we keep on hinting at it, was the layoffs that we found out. And this was the biggest set of layoffs when it comes to professional wrestlers, at least, uh, since 2005. Um, I was listening to uh, Wrestling Inc. after they were covering basically this and then also the Wednesday Night Wars shows between NXT and AEW. And uh, and um, uh, Matt Morgan was on there. And he said this, like, 2005 was a huge they just got rid of a lot of talent and just that's how it was. And this is actually now the biggest since then. So it's been a while since they've had this many cuts. Some of them, um, especially the producers, uh, have been told that this is they'll be furloughed. Uh, from what I gather of what furloughed actually means uh, within a company is that they have to let you go now, uh, but with the intent of being able to pick you up once things get started with producers. That makes a lot of sense because, I mean, they have a couple that they have. Why would they need 10 other people to try to produce matches when they don't need that people? They've gone down to a secluded uh, group of people. And as unfortunate as it is, I'm not, especially if that's the case, I should say, I'm not worried about them as much as I'm worried about some of these talents. Um, so the list of talents, uh, wrestler-wise, and then we'll get to the producers. But the wrestlers... Uh, that were let go. And I will say, realize that a lot of people that think that WWE's cold for this, before I go into this, realize every company, and I think Brian Alvarez said this. Um, no, no, it was Solomon, sir. He said this. I swear to God, I get them always mixed up because they have a similar attitude together. But, you know, every company in the United States, big or small, are having to do cuts. Now, you can be a dreamer, if you will, and, um, you know, fucking look at rainbows and shit. And say, well, why don't why don't you fire Brock Lesnar? He, uh, you know, if the amount that you have for him would be able to pay for these guys' salaries. Uh, blah 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 blah. Or, well, why did you do Saudi Arabia? Okay, I'm sorry, you are very unrealistic. The list of people right here, most of them, a good chunk of them, wanted to go. Now, this situation of how it hits fucking sucks. I will admit that completely. But a lot of them wanted to be cut and let go because they weren't happy. They're going to be paid for 90 days afterwards. They have a 90 days no compete, and then in which they can try to figure something out. That's three months, and hopefully by then, a lot of this situation will have MLW back up and running. We'll have Ring of Honor back up and running. We'll have Impact doing shows like they're doing sparingly uh, in empty places, but back up and running, you know. That's the biggest thing with a lot of these going, a lot of these wrestlers getting cut, I should say. Um, they don't have anywhere to go. Everyone's assuming AEW is going to hire all of them. That That's not the case. AEW is taking a huge hit financially, too, and they're a new product. And as we'll talk about with the ratings, as much as I say it doesn't matter, in the realm of things, this is the second week now. Somehow NXT has beat them, uh, not by a large amount, but still. So AEW financially putting these shows on in Norcross, Georgia, at Cody's gym and also in Florida at the uh, Jacksonville Amphitheater, wherever they're going to be, they, they're not, they're not making money with gate. I mean, they're, they're losing a lot of money too. So they're not going to pick up everyone. Ring of honor is shut down right now. Impact doing things sparingly. You know, it's not like they have a, a, even Anthem being a huge corporation. They're not going to put money into something that's, you know, a, a smaller. So you can't just expect that to happen. Uh, New Japan shut down. So, like, all the different entities of where people could go, you know, Mike Kanellis, Maria Kanellis, they'd be fine because you would think they could just go to Ring of Honor, and that's probably inevitably where they'll go. Now they don't have that option, so that's where it sucks. But at the same time, you know, stuff like this is going to happen, unfortunately. And to think, well, you know, hindsight with Saudi Arabia, that deal's already happened. No one knew this was going to fucking happen. Or, or Brock Lesnar, you know getting rid of him or having to pay Goldberg. Look, I agree with you to the Goldberg stuff, but no one knew this was going to happen. And you might think that they're, that WWE has all this money, but within actual cash, actual money, they don't have as much as you think. So even though this sucks, even though it's a shitty way of doing it, that's kind of how it is. So um, before I go into the list, do you have any comments on what I just said, Chris? 
No, and I, I mean, to some extent, I understand why, res- like, some fans would be upset. There is a was a five hundred million dollar buffer for a situation like this that WWE had. I think that's a lot of what people are upset about. Um, is that you see all of these wrestlers being let go? Now that being said, about half of this list, actually more more than half of it, are wrestlers who are either very underutilized or I haven't seen on the product um, outside of like mate what is it, main event in almost a year. So like I can't remember the last time I saw No Way Jose on TV, for instance. So I mean the the people they cut. They, I mean, they cut people that either have said they didn't want to be there or have been highly underutilized. There are two big names on this list that I'm very surprised by just because they recently resigned. But for the most part, yeah, I agree with, with kind of everything you said. And, and uh, you know, there, there's two or three names on this list I'm surprised by. The rest of them are people, like I said, that who, who have either wanted to leave or have not been heavily utilized on television in a long time. And WWE was just kind of keeping them under contract basically to prevent them from going to either AEW or Impact or Ring of Honor uh, in a lot of cases, like Rusev being one of them. And I think that's the biggest problem, what you just brought up, is the fact that Vince did all this to try to prevent them. But once again, as ridiculous as that is and how Vince is, no one saw it coming where all of a sudden we'd be cut off like this because of an epidemic. So, you know, it is how it is. I'll list all the people. And I'll kind of just give insight based on things. I think, Chris, I'm assuming who you were talking to first was Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows, who um, were just re-signed with a pretty damn substantial contract back in the summertime, convinced by WWE and AJ that they would stay as a unit. Um, Carl Anderson's already posted a picture of Japan saying, um, uh, I want to go back home or or to some extent on Twitter. Um, there's a good chance Gallows and Anderson will be in Japan once that gets up and running, I would assume. Or because Chris Jericho is such good friends with both of them and they started bonding as a group and traveling together, maybe he'll try to get them to AEW. They are people on this list. There are people, I should say, on this list that I could see going to AEW. Um, not all of them. Then we have EC3. Uh, EC3 wanted to release. Uh, and remember, Gallows and Anderson, before they got that giant contract, wanted their release. EC3, I think there's there's plenty of places. Uh, NWA comes to mind. Obviously, they're down. Impact. He would make a but a impact over at Impact again because he was a big name there. Uh, there's a couple of guys that are ex-Impact guys that I think could really help them out. And I'm not going to lie. I mean – it's possible uh, because of his age and because he knows a bunch of people that AEW could be. He's someone that's kind of iffy. I mean, it's a possibility. Um, he might be too close to MJF. I don't know. Uh, but there's EC3. Rusev, I think, is someone that I think AEW would inevitably be the place for him because I think that he's made himself a big enough name with the audience and that, very similar to Luke Harper, Matt Hardy, he would get received really well by the audience at AEW. Uh, Leo Rush, and who's had a great attitude about this in videos and interviews, you know, he's changed so much drastically since uh, he, right before in WWE, where he was kind of, I don't know, people kind of considered him uh, a hothead, but he seems like he's grounded himself a lot. He thinks. He thanked WWE. He said basically he'll figure, you know, wherever he goes and he'll be good wherever he goes. He's someone that I could see a lot of different places possibly going for because he's talented. His in-ring ability, especially when it comes to smaller guys, is extremely impressive. And, you know, he's he's got charisma and he can talk for days. So I could see Ring of Honor, New Japan, AEW, any of those outlets uh, going for him. Maybe not um, – Maybe not so much with NWA, but you get what I'm saying. Drake Maverick, especially as a package with EC3, is 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 a uh, you know pretty w- w- would be good together. Him like he used to be kind of being the the uh, the manager, if you will. But you know, Rockstar Spud, he can go back to Impact. Uh, that's where I think is probably uh, his destination. Heath Slater, also another person who's asked for his release. Uh, several times before in the past, understandably so. 
I could see going to NWA. I could see going to other places and doing well. Eric Young, Impact also is another place where just go back home, try to get that influx of talent of guys that used to be there and give reason for people to watch it. Kurt Hawkins has his own um, gym and training facility. So I know that's his biggest thing, and that's why he had a very limited schedule with WWE, mostly doing stuff for main event. So maybe he'll just go to that. I'm sure he would still take indie dates and could be hired by some of these companies. Aiden English proved himself not only as an efficient wrestler, but also as a great announcer. And I think, you know, I'm not going to put him in the Howard Fink, but if, if someone wanted a really good ring announcer, I think that he could be actually really good for them. Um, he's got a very distinct voice. So I think that's 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 there. Uh, Sarah Logan, along with Deanna Prazzo, I think could both do really well in the women's division, AEW, to add some oomph to it. Uh, so there's that concept. Uh, Eric Rowan, you know, Luke Harper, it is one of his best friends. I don't know, or I should say Brody Lee. I don't know if he tries to get them. Then I said the Canellises, Ring of Honor seems like a smart place. Dreamo and Epico haven't been over here doing anything. I'm sure they'll stay in Puerto Rico uh, with their father's company and keep on working at it out there. Zach Ryder, uh, Cody already made a comment about Zach saying that, and he posted the video of him winning the um, Intercontinental title at WrestleMania several years ago and praised him a lot. It was a very nice statement. So that's another person that I had in my four, if you will, along with Rusev, Gallows, and Anderson, that I would say is the most likely to be someone that AEW picks up. And No Way Jose, who, if we can get past the gimmick and let him actually wrestle like he was in NXT, he could do really well for himself. So um, – it just, it's, like I said, it's unfortunate, but there is a chunk of these people that were either sparingly used, you know, so you got to understand that, or they were trying to get out of their contract for a long time anyway. So uh, I don't know. I, I think that there's still big things for a lot of these guys. And like I said, I think that if we're going to go who I predict going to AEW or has the most potential, it would be Gallows and Anderson, uh, Zack Ryder. And Rusev, Gals and Anderson, if you want to make that tag division, you get the revival in there and you get Gals and Anderson. That's a beefed up tag division over in AEW and the ladies as well, too, because they need more women. They're they're building a strong women's division finally over at AEW. But um, Zach, I'd love to see him be able to actually be put in the spotlight in a company. I think that would be awesome. Same thing with Rusev. But a lot of these guys will do well outside of the WWE, the 90 day no compete. If you think about it, as, as annoying as that is, they're still getting paid for the next three months. So, like I said, hopefully things are up and running by then, if we're going to be positive about it. Now, I'm going to go over to producers, but so I will shut up and stop rambling so much. Chris, you have the list in front of you. How do you feel about the people that worker-wise? Yeah, it, I, I think you hit the nail on the head as far as the the big names um, that I was talking about being, you know, Anderson and Gallows. I, I'm more surprised by that because they just did this big WrestleMania match kind of with The Undertaker, worked this program, re-signed to that big lucrative contract on the advice of, you know, AJ and the thought of getting to work with him. Um, I would say that they've been kind of underutilized and have even been buried to some extent in some of the matches they've done. <laughs> I don't know if this was a mutual decision or if it was just a, you know, that contract was pretty heavy. If you think about both of them, I would love to see them go back to New Japan. I could also see them end up working in AEW at some point um, down the road. Uh, you could even see them do something similar with maybe a split contract if AEW will work something out like that, where they could work in both places similar to, you know, a Jericho or Dean Ambrose. I think that they have kind of the swagger to do that and are a big, you know, a big name tag team that you could bring in, um, you know, to, to beat up the young bucks and uh, kind of that old bullet club versus new bullet club. And you could do that in kind of both places if they wanted to. Um, so they're, you know, they're the ones that I feel kind of the safest on having a general idea of them being picked up by someone because they had already had offers out there before they re-signed with, uh, with WWE. Um, people like EC3, Eric Young, uh, they're, I mean, they're almost kind of legend status, former champions in Impact. I think it might make the most sense for them to go back there if possible. But, you know, with Eric Young specifically, I don't know if he would ever want to, but I could see him 
you know, working in Ring of Honor or going to New Japan and being able to work that style just fine and, and come across like a million bucks. He's a great performer and kind of someone just once again underutilized outside of uh, well, I can't remember what the name of his group was, but outside of the group that he had in NXT, they have done kind of nothing with him except have him in a few squash matches. Trick Maverick, it was kind of heartbreaking to watch his uh, Twitter video, just how sad he was yesterday and, and how it affected him. And and basically him just saying, you know, there's wrestlers that I'll never get a face that I wanted to face, people that I enjoyed working with, ever work with again. Talking about his, you know, final three matches um, with NXT. And, uh, yeah, it was just really, really sad overall. Um, I think the rest of the people we ran down the list on, Aiden English, I think, when he did commentary uh, at, after the Saudi thing, where he was kind of a fill-in, uh, I thought he did a great job there. So if he wanted to do commentary somewhere, they could redo that tag team with Stu Grif- uh, Grimson, who is not under contract if they wanted to. The Vaude Villains, that was a big thing in NXT. He could do something there uh, if they wanted oh, to do he's a tag actually, team act. Uh... He's in. Um, he's now in uh, Frank Gotch or not Frank Gotch. Um, Simon Gotch. He's now in MLW as a part of their their villain group. I forgot what it's called, but it's with uh, Jacob Fatu and um, the Sheik, the Sheik, the second Sheik, the the grandson of the Sheik. I got uh, contraband. So I mean, Aiden English could be an announcer for there and even interact with them. I mean, I, I definitely could see that. For yeah, sure. I, could, I could see him doing some stuff with the Vaude Villain as a tag team, whether it be in MLW or. Um, you know, I, it depends on what their MLW contract looks like. They could work multiple places, depending on what that contract is. Um, Kurt Hawkins and Zack Ryder. I guess the only thing good about them both getting released together is I, I think that means they can keep doing their podcast. I was worried at first it was just Kurt Hawkins um, and not Zack Ryder as far as names that were released. And I was like, man, I wonder what that actually means, because it, it seems like the thing that they actually – really really love is that their figure podcast and their collecting podcast that they do and it's actually really really good listen if you guys are into collecting at all um i recommend checking it out but uh it's uh it's it's, i feel like they could have done so much more with zach Ryder specifically um he's a guy that got himself over multiple times and then they just never wanted to push him for whatever reason i don't know if he annoys vince to some extent or what but seeing him be able to take uh, his personality and how big he is on his podcast and, and how he got himself over with the Long Island Ice Z shit in WWE and take it somewhere that will allow him to kind of be himself and maybe actually get himself over. I think that would be very, very intriguing. I could see, you know, him doing very well on Impact. I could also see him doing very, very well in AEW if they wanted to go that route with him. Um, he's another he's a guy that's surprisingly big that I think people forget about. Um, like how actual, like what Zack Ryder's, as far as like his wrestling size goes, uh, some of the other names like Epico and Primo, they haven't been on TV in like a year and a half and they were just suspended from the company off like a drug test. They said they never took. So that one I kind of thought was (laughs) a bit weird. Like at one point they were like, we didn't even know we still worked there. I think was one of their comments. So (laughs) I'm assuming they, uh. They're going to, like you said, stay in Puerto Rico. Mike and Maria, I, to me, it makes the most sense. If they fall back home in Ring of Honor, that's kind of where they made themselves known. So um, Sarah Logan, I'm very surprised on just because they had been pushing her and trying to build her and for her to get and, let And her go. husband still works for the uh, company, too. <laughs> the yeah. Yeah, so that one was that was another one that was really surprising when you sent me the full list with Sarah Logan because it's it just seemed like they were you know trying to do something with her. Um, Heath Slater, he has a wrestling school here in Atlanta. I'm wondering if he would want to focus more on that and then maybe do NWA, which is taped here. I think he could be a really fun character in NWA uh, if they if he wanted to go that route, but. Um, yeah, like you said, I think the four that we kind of know are going to land somewhere is going to be Carl Anderson, Luke Gallows, um, Rusev, who there's been feelers out for already, and then um, Zack Ryder to some extent. Just because Zack Ryder, to me, is probably out of these guys to the WWE audience is the most over. 
on this list as far as known, you know, the big WrestleMania Intercontinental Championship match, all of the stuff he's done in the past with John Cena. I mean, he is the one that's been kind of is, is kind of in the forefront as far as being to the WWE crowd now to like indie fans and new japan fans carl anderson luke gal is obviously probably the most over uh ec3 I, I don't know where he fits in like like i said i mean some of these guys i feel like he's like uh he's like leo rush you know i could see them in AEW, but i could see them somewhere else as well but they're big enough i think if pushed correctly to be an AEW. i just think i could also see them just in ring of honor or impact or whatever you know yeah but i wonder how much e- like people really remember ec3 at this point like <laughs> they probably five, don't. five years removed from his last TNA run, almost. Um, uh, Chris, he is the 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 nephew of Dixie Carter. <laughs> it's true. I mean, the only thing is, like AEW just signed a bunch of big guys that are kind of like him, like Wardlow, for instance. So I don't even know what they would do with EC3, really. I mean, I guess you I could know. throw him in as a member. So like, there's certain people on these lists, and you and I would just keep in mind, you know, even 90 days from now, there's still a good probability that people will still be working from home, just normal people, not wrestlers. Yep. So if if the idea is that you know AEW is still running as is, and they're not able to really, they're going to have to do try to do empty arena pay per views. Um, obviously they still have their contract, their TV contracts and stuff will still be in place, but they're not making any revenue at the door. And, um, unlike WWE, they are fronting the bill for their shows. So when they were doing arena shows, the full production and everything, I think that when we talked about this previously, the way that contract worked out is they're paying basically to lease the building, run the event, and you know pay for all of the filming etc so it was like estimated at four hundred thousand dollars a show to run live now that they're doing that that taped it's a little different but there i mean there's cost involved in all of this stuff that i don't think people are thinking of so like 90 days from now i don't see if things are still the way they are i don't see any of these guys getting signed as unfortunate as that sounds i mean tony tony khan obviously has some deep pockets being part of the khan family and maybe he rolls the dice on Anderson and Gallows, but it's going to be really hard to see, you know, all of these people getting re-signed right away. And that's kind of what I saw mostly from the Internet and fan feedback yesterday is just everyone was like, oh, well, everyone will get will get signed almost immediately. And I honestly, I don't think that's going to be the case. Yeah, that's because people are stupid. Um, No, I'm just kidding. Anyways, I'm not really kidding. But yeah, that's that's the whole thing. It's like expecting them to get hired. Well, the only company is AEW. Yeah, AEW will just grab them all. But I mean, they're taking a financial hit right now. They're a new company. Like, I just don't understand the logic in that. Like I said, the four people that I listed, and I kind of would like to say that maybe Leo Rush and EC3 are kind of on the out and those two ladies that I mentioned, Sarah Logan and Deanna Parasso. But those four... It would make sense if Gallows and Anderson don't want to go to if, – if or like you said, if they want to be able to go to Japan, AEW will be a part of a huge tag division that they're building. You know, think about this. It's a tag division that potentially will have Revival, Gallows and Anderson, the Young Bucks, LAX, the Best Friends. I mean this and, – and so many other ones I'm not even mentioning, uh, the Lucha Brothers. Uh, that's pretty fucking impressive since they actually care about tag team wrestling. And then they have the option when it gets up and running to go to Japan. They're also best friends, like I said, with Chris Jericho. That one makes sense. Rusev and Zack Ryder have gotten themselves over several times by themselves in WWE. People wanted them to be top guys. It was a company that held them back. They're both extremely impressive in the ring. They have charisma for days. And a lot of people, very much like Brody Lee, they want to see them do well. They want to see them actually get a chance to be bigger wrestlers like a lot of people think they can. So that's why I always go back to those top four or those those four people. I don't want to say top four. I want all these guys to do well. But uh, Cody even said it in a comment talking about Zach with that, like I said, that picture of him winning the IC belt. I'd like to take a moment to say how proud I am of my friend Zach Ryder. In a world of weekend warriors and play wrestlers, this dude excludes uh, exudes passion and to try professional wrestling like no other. Through 14 years to see him consistently try to better himself – whether it be his in-ring work or watching him physically mold himself uh, with his body into a specimen drug-free with hard work and will. 
I have a little rule, and that's that if you're if you've gotten over in wrestling, you can always do so again. The rule being fully acceptable to Matt now. At 30 years young, his best wrestling days are ahead of him. Cheers to a great start and 14 years of unrelenting blood, sweat, and tears. Further endeavors are limitless when you actually endeavor. I choose this picture because it was one of the last days that WWE watching 80,000 people applaud as Matt won gold was an eruption not only live in the arena, but in the locker room as well. Hearing Dolph coordinate for his father to come over the rails, meanwhile I was ass deep into the broken ladder and stuck but had the best <laughs> seat in the house. And seeing father-son embrace, I thought it'd be jealous or bitter, but I was truly happy and proud for one of my peers and cried. Congratulations, my friend, and good luck. Very nice thing for Cody to say. Now, that could just be nothing and just him uh, saying stuff about his friend. But I'm sorry. There are the Young Bucks, Kenny Omega, Cody, you know, um, Chris Jericho to an extent. All those guys, if they're saying you need – like there's certain people that probably will be proposed to Tony as a good idea. That's what I'll just say. And well, yeah, I could see yeah. Zack Ryder being able to restart and refresh himself over in AEW. But other than those four, everyone else is kind of – I hope from the best once things get up and running. Any other closing statements before we go over to the producers? Yeah, I would just I would rope this back to something Jericho said. AEW is not trying to sign every wrestler. Yeah, that's, in, that's a good point. Keep in mind that they have a very they have a one night a week TV show, and then they have Dark on YouTube. It's hard to get a ton of people over without sacrificing the quality of your show. Mm-hmm. So the people that they sign, they have to be very careful with. I don't see them, like I said, like I li- I like and, these three. I just it's and I like Eric Rowan. Um, but at some point, I don't. How do you fit all of these characters on your TV show? Now, granted, next year they're going to have two nights, in theory, because they signed that contract deal. Um, but. I mean, that's that's another thing that you have to contend with when you think about signing these people is are you actually going to have anything for them to do or are they going to be back in the same spot that they kind of were in, in WWE in a lot of these situations? Absolutely. All right, let's talk about the producers that were furloughed. Like I said, that means that the hopes is that once this is all done, they'll, they'll hire them back. Uh, right now they are basically, I'm assuming, filing for unemployment. Um, but... One in particular kind of sucks because Lance Storm just got hired recently and he shut down his school to pursue this. So, yeah, he can reopen it, but that kind of, you know, Billy Kidman, first person, has been there uh, along with the invasion, basically, uh, with the company. And he started, I think, in 2006. A lot of people, when it comes to high fly matches, uh, wrestlers consider Billy, Billy Kidman one of the best producers to put them together with them. Mike Rotunda. Uh, Fit Finley, who the women's division especially, he's he's helped out a lot uh, with structuring matches. Scott Armstrong, uh, Sarah Stock, who uh, was the one driving force producing the uh, the Mandy Rose, you know, um, Otis uh, storyline. Shane uh, Shane Hurricane Helms, who just got hired after leaving Impact. Um, Lance Storm, like I said, Shandavari, and then Pat Buck. Um, so WWE is hoping to get them back. But you got to realize they don't need a shit ton of producers since they're not able to, you know, do as much and they have to limit based on regulation with everything going on. So just sucks. But um, any any statements about some of these guys? I mean, Chris, you got to understand now they don't have Arne Anderson. They don't have Dean Malenko. They don't have they don't have Billy Kidman. Technically, they don't have Fit Finley. Those are like some of the bigger ones uh, that were producing some of our favorite matches in the 2000s. Yeah, and I mean, Fit Finley, like you said, with the women's division is kind of imperative there. I mean, to the point where they actually used him in angles with Natty and and uh, Becky just recently, uh, not not that long ago. So it that is kind of crazy. I mean, those are some big names that have been there for a long time. Um, I'm wondering if the this is if it is the concept that they were furloughed to some extent. Um, I'm wondering if that's they're shifting more to the NXT kind of road agents to do this taping process because, you know, 
I, I say that, but then the idea is that they're going back live. So <laughs> I don't really know. I didn't know Davari was a road agent um, or a producer, a match producer. Um, that one kind of surprised me. Um, but the everyone else, I mean, those are those are names that have been there for quite a while, uh, with the exception of Lance and uh, Shane Helms, obviously. Um, I'm surprised Jeff Jarrett didn't hit this list, honestly. Cause or Terry came, Taylor. Because some of those guys came in. Terry's been there for a lot, for quite a bit, but um, Jeff came in there like right before, right after the Hall of Fame, right? So he's yep. been there a little bit longer than Shane Helms. Um, yeah, just surprising I'm also overall. Forgetting, I'm also forgetting he was a talent technically, but they haven't used him in a while, but he's also been working as a main producer Kurt Angle was let go, and referee Mike Kyoto, who's been there since 1989 and been a huge ref there. Both of them are on furlough right now as well. I mean, for Mike Kyoto is like associated with so many big matches. It's kind of crazy that they're. I mean, that's like their because they don't have Earl Hebner anymore. He was like their Earl, you know, like after Earl left, obviously, but he's kind of was the mainstay ref, you know, like it, it, with WCW it was Neil Patrick for instance, and then WWF, you had Earl Hebner. You always feel like there needs to be that one guy. And 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 like AEW, to their credit, I think they've done a good job making Audrey Edwards that person as like the referee I think of when I think about, you know, a match in my mind for AEW. She's immediately the ref that comes to mind. Mike Kyoto would be my WWE guy. And now that he's gone, I have no fucking idea who the rest of the refs are. They're just guys. Uh, Little niche. <laughs> Oh yeah, little Nate is still there. Yeah, so I guess he would be the no guy. Um, but yeah, I agree with you. It, 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 that that one's surprising, and uh, Kurt Angle. I don't, I don't know what his role was. I don't know. <laughs> was was like is he if he was still under contract as a wrestler, I could understand letting him go because they don't plan on utilizing him, and I wonder if. What this means for people that are on Legends contracts, are there going to be more of these? And I guess that's a question I could pose to you, too. When, we, when we're when we looking at this in the grand scheme of things, you know, Ring of Honor just started shelling out money f- to put some bigger contracts than they've ever done before. For instance, the Marty Scroll deal that they worked out. Do we start seeing them, in theory, cut people as well? The, which uh, which of these companies are going to be the first to follow suit? Because I don't think this is going to be limited to just WWE. Not only that, I don't think this is just it for WWE. I could see some other people, and I don't want to see anyone in NXT get cut, but them cutting some more ends. And, uh, yeah, I agree with you. There are going to be other companies. You have Anthem uh, w- with Impact that's finally started putting some money and trying to hire people and, and build up – you know, uh, impact into something bigger. And the same thing, you have Sinclair Broadcasting trying to do that with Ring of Honor, hiring people, um, you know, with the with them not doing anything. I, like I said, I think Impact has done, like, empty place. I haven't been able to watch the show, but I think they've done some recordings, but I don't know if they're going to be doing any more. Ring of Honor's down. NWA is down. Uh, New Japan is down. So, I don't know. Yeah, and there's an added level of complexity with Impact because they record in Canada, right? Yeah, that's a good point. So that, that goes back to the NHL thing where if the Canadian borders are closed, how the hell do you even get your talent there? Ugh. So, Which is – wow. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Um, I don't know, but it's – like I said, all of this is unfortunate. And there's been so many – it's not just the producers and talent. There's so many staff members – that are part of it, writers um, that that got let go. So a lot of people lost their jobs, and um, hoping hoping the best for them because you know it, it it sucks. And there are wrestlers that I can think of. I don't I don't want to be negative, but I could also see being kind of let go in the next couple of days. There's another Impact legend, Chris. I think you know exactly what I'm talking about, who's been kind of accident prone. As of recently, they get Bobby Roode into something and then he hurts himself again. And for some reason, Vince has never looked at him the way, you know, I would never think like a Samoa Joe would be taken away. But I could see Bobby Roode. There's certain other wrestlers that just don't get utilized um, that I could see, unfortunately, getting let go. And I hope that doesn't happen. But you know what I'm saying? 
Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a few there. I mean, so you could even point to. I mean, I think it would be crazy, but you could point to Samoa Joe and and look at the injury history that he's had in WWE as of late the past two years, um, and say maybe it's time to move on from someone like that. Um, it's it's insane. But I I when we first saw this list, that was one of the things that I said. I, I, at that time, I think it was what eight people. And I said, well, there, there's going to be more coming, I would just assume. And then I also think that there's going to be other companies that will have to follow suit unless they're paying per appearance. And, you know, in some scenarios like NWA, those contracts are a little different because they're per season of the show. So obviously, if there's no season, they're not paying out. But anyone that's on like an actual contract deal, you, you know, I... <laughs> It's going to be it's going to be surprising to see. But generally, if WWE does something like this, you see people start following suit like the same thing with Ring of Honor starting to sign talent. Yep. When when WWE started to load up so with AEW as well, they started to sign more talent. So usually, you know, hopefully this doesn't affect AEW negatively or it doesn't affect any of these companies negatively. But I'm I'm it, it's it's almost crazy to think that it would just only be WWE when WWE oh, yeah. is does have those large TV deals in place still still so they're still making money um it's, it's just they're trimming the fat down as much as they can i mean Vince just shut down lost Vince just lost 300 million dollars on XFL and yep. their stocks their stocks sitting at 38 dollars or it was as of yesterday um which 2 years ago or a year ago or whatever it was close to 100 so that kind of just shows you the state of not only WWE, but the economy in general. So them making moves like this is while it sucks and it really does suck for a lot of these performers in some ways, if you look at where WWE is and, and the uncertainty of the future, I would expect there almost to be more um, things like this. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you look at the producers, that are available. Yeah, you have, like you said, Terry Taylor. Don't see him going anywhere. Jeff Jarrett's a very new person. You know, like you said, I was also surprised. Uh, not that I want, like I said, Jeff Jarrett to lose his job, but newer, has had problems before in the past, you know, with WWE. Uh, and then you go to NXT. It's like, I guess they're allowing their agents from NXT to. We, we heard that. You know, for WrestleMania, some of the matches were put together by Triple H, by William Regal, by by um, by uh, what you call it, a uh, Road Dog. You know, um, and it seems like and I'm sure Terry Taylor was involved. Then you have the two Impact guys that didn't get fired with Abyss and Sanjay Dutt. You know, who knows, man? Maybe when all this is said and done, Impact, uh, Don, you know, Don Callis can get all the originators and have everyone back there. I, I don't want that to happen necessarily, but you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Abyss and Sanjay Dutt are two other people that get kind of clipped off for agents if they don't need them, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a good point. Um, it's, it's kind of crazy. It, the, the whole, the whole scenario and all these people being let go. I, I, WWE usually in the past, they didn't last year, but there generally is a layoff not of this magnitude after mania. So you kind of always assume there's going to be two or three people, but this is probably the biggest one I remember. Um, I, I mean, I, I know you brought up 2005 earlier. That would have been during a huge down slump for WWE. That's the beginning of kind of the, whatever, whatever John Cena's era was called. Right. So kind of the change of the guard from ruthless aggression to that, but it's uh PG. Yeah, the PG era and uh, their TV contracts kind of changing multiple times. So from Spike to TNT or TNN, I should say, then back to USA. So that was a that was a weird time, too. But I, I don't even remember who all got fired from that. This this one is a that's a huge list of people. And some like I said, some of those are big name people that have been in WWE for a while. Zack Ryder is is one of those guys. And not only that, like Zack Ryder, some of those people have significant others still in the company, like Zack Ryder with uh, Chelsea Green and Sarah Logan with, uh, I forgot, I guess it's not Ivar, it's the other one, a part of um, 
I got so used to their old names. I can't remember it, though. But you get what I'm saying. This is affecting a lot of people just in general. Um, and it's very unfortunate. So I guess let's move on to some more positive stuff and just hope that all those wrestlers end up in places that they can be fully utilized and really be able to show how great they are. And if you're someone, I'm sorry, I don't care if you're, if you're WWE and just AEW, like expand your horizons, especially if you just watch WWE as a product. There's so much good wrestling out there right now. We have a downtime. All those companies aren't up, but now you have a chance to catch up on a lot of their products from MLW. So some of the new stuff that impact's been doing some of the new stuff that ring of honor has been doing, um, NWA, I mean, it's only had two seasons so far and also new Japan. So check out some stuff, uh, get more informed and realize that these are going to be the locations that a lot of your favorite wrestlers out of this list are going to end up. Um, but yeah, any closing statements before we move on to some reviews, buddy? No, it's just going to be crazy seeing some of these guys, if they go back to impact, especially after I've been watching all of that old impact this week. Chris, Chris, <laughs> what if, what if like, you know, in a year impact now has backed abyss, Sanjay Dunn, fucking Bobby Roode, uh, Eric Young, EC3, Drake Maverick. <laughs> what if they're, I mean, Hey, it makes a lot of sense, and now they're under new management. I know that one of the person that, that's that's in charge, a lot of people aren't fond of, but Don Callis has tried to change the aspect of the Dixie Carter error, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's it's just crazy. But I, like I said, when you when you brought up watching old wrestling or, or just watching other wrestling, it made me think of uh, Toby Keith giving Jeff Jarrett a suplex. <laughs> it's the first Jeff thing Jarrett's another one. Mind. Uh, hey, thank you, Pluto TV, for allowing me and Chris to enjoy watching a bunch of random uh, different parts in the lineage of uh, Impact. <laughs> Starting from the beginning, going to the middle, and going right to like a couple weeks ago, you know? It's crazy. Love that shit. All right, so let's, uh, let's move on to Monday Night Raw. Uh... Okay. I will say, man, I know a lot of people are complaining because the re- the matches themselves, it's like I, I can get it both sides, but still it kind of makes me just roll my eyes to an extent. I love the wrestling aspect of wrestling, and I love them making me believe that this fight is real that I'm watching. Uh, but some people kind of like more of the glitz and glamour. I get it. But one of the biggest complaints is that some people are getting too much offense in matches. But at the same time, I think we're getting really well-structured matches. And if Aleister Black, whether he be in the ring with Apollo Crews, whether he be in the ring with Oni Lorcan wants to have a badass match and they keep on going with it, I I think that's beneficial for all of us to watch. So a lot of these these guys are kind of getting a chance to shine the ring. And we're getting good wrestling, actual, like, good in-ring wrestling. So... I don't know. I don't have really a lot of complaints about that. Chris, do you have do you, like do you do you have a similar problem with it, or are you like me when, when it comes to longer matches with lesser, I guess, uh, wrestlers compared to someone like an Aleister Black? I mean, I could see the complaint, but the same people are going to bitch if the match lasted two minutes, so it it doesn't matter. <laughs> That's a very very good point. Oh God. All right. So we started with a video package about Drew McIntyre winning the WWE championship from Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania. And I will say, man, you know, I didn't think of it at the time, Chris. It is really not that bad in in, in, in concept that he beat Brock Lesnar and then beat the big show back to back on WrestleMania night, even if they show the big show match uh, the next Raw. You know, in theory, if we go kayfabe, that lo- makes you look pretty fucking that makes you look pretty damn strong, I would say, as a champion. Uh, would you agree? Yeah, I mean, they've done a really good job of pushing uh, Drew so far. I mean, even the way he won in, in the Rumble, I thought, looked very, very strong and dominant. And then he hasn't – he's just been demolishing people since then. So as far as if you're trying to push him as this big monster champion, your new Brock Lesnar, your new top guy, they've done a good job with that. They just have to be careful to the point where they're not – when you start having him go against someone like a Seth Rollins or a Kevin Owens, 
you got to make sure that you don't end up with the Roman Reigns situation where the guy just looks unbeatable um, or a Brock Lesnar situation because the fans do turn on that very quickly. Right now, people are really, I think, into Drew McIntyre. It's just a, uh, a let's just say that you're walking on a tightrope to, to some extent. Absolutely. Well, Drew McIntyre entered uh, the ring and cut a promo thanking the audience for watching and doing the positive reception to his WWE championship win. It was really nice. Like, you know, I, like I said, I watched that documentary of Drew McIntyre being very excited, winning the Royal Rumble, and then obviously all the stuff happening and realizing he was going to be in an empty arena for WrestleMania. And a lot of us, I think, assumed that he would win. He ended up winning. But apparently, and I think he was very genuine when he said there was an uproar of people messaging him and just saying that they 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 were happy that he was champion and that they wish they were able to be there to cheer him on. So I thought that was good. He's coming off just like an NXT man, like a good baby face. Like the heel worked, but I would rather Drew kind of be like this. And when he gets mad and aggressive, he comes off like, you know, like like Braveheart and shit like that than trying to be a swarmy uh, heel. I just didn't think it worked as well. Um, but uh, after commenting, a highlight video is the feed of the big show. He invited other wrestlers to challenge for his title. US, U.S. champion Andrade entered with Selena Vega, who brought up that Andrade beat McIntyre for the NXT championship. McIntyre challenged Andrade to a champion versus champion match, and Andrade accepted. I really, really like this because usually they don't bring up the the past stuff in NXT with people. They just don't. And I liked how they presented this because Zelina and Andrade, when they were talking, they were kind of going around it. And I kind of thought as an NXT fan, they're not going to even fucking bring it up. They're going to bring up the concept, but they're not going to really go into it. And no, finally, Drew McIntyre said, I get it. I know what you guys are saying. You know, you beat me last time and I screwed up my my uh, hamstring and I was out for six months of my career because of that injury. And all that was true. And I love them bringing those aspects back. I think that not only are they doing great work with Drew McIntyre on Raw, but they're doing great work with Zelina Vega as well, who's becoming a very, very good manager um, and, and, and creating a pretty damn good group of efficient wrestlers. But we'll get back to that later on. But, um, yeah, I like this presented. It wouldn't work out, obviously. But champion versus champion, Andrade saying, hey, man, you know, not saying that there's other people that probably should go first. But I did beat your ass, put you out on the shelf for six months, and took your uh, NXT World Heavyweight belt. So just remember that. And I like that. I like them bringing that up. What do you think, Chris? I think it's really good to revisit historical moments in wrestling and not forget about them. So I'll give them a little bit of credit this week on actually doing that as opposed to what they normally do, which is just ignore that the shit ever happened. Um, so I like that. And I, I agree with you. I think Selena Vega right now is probably what the second best manager in wrestling. I you put her behind Jake yeah. the snake. Yeah. So I, I like that little group they're forming. I'm interested to see what they're doing. Austin theory is kind of like a weird choice for the group, but, um, it's been, he's been entertaining to watch. So I'm looking forward to seeing where they go with it for sure. And Andrade versus, uh, and drew that's always that's always a fun matchup. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that. Um, so, yeah, so we would then have a uh, – it looks like they're going to be doing the Money in the Banks, uh, the women's first, uh, some of the qualifying match, then go to the men's, and then go back to the women's, and go back to the men's, which I really like. And a lot of people, they picked – I, I think it's really good. Um, we had the first Money in the Bank uh, ladder qualifying match, uh, and Asuka went against Ruby Riot. It was so refreshing, once again, to see Ruby Riot and Asuka be able to work like they did in NXT. I've seen these ladies beat the shit out of each other, and they had another match like that, and Ruby got a lot of offense in, but Asuka finally got her with the Asuka lock, and she immediately tapped, just making Asuka look strong. And I just like the competition factor when it comes to pro wrestling. And I just thought that that both ladies did a really good job. And obviously, I want Asuka to go ahead. But Ruby Riot looked pretty damn good in this match. Um, how, how did you feel about it, Chris? I think it's the best match Ruby Riot's had since coming back from injury. It was fun getting to see her kind of be highlighted again. And uh, obviously, I'm kind of on the same page as you where I feel like Asuka's 
gonna is the biggest bigger star out of this uh situation but the match itself i thought was pretty good and it was uh nice to see them kind of put ruby into a a match where she can kind of highlight some of her talents because she was really really good before she got injured um so hopefully they do something to rebuild her up a little bit and maybe this is the start of that and i'm not i'm not gonna say completely uh, but it seems the matches just seem like they're more on the quality of an NXT match than a Monday night, Monday night raw match, uh, for me, for a lot of these ones, uh, this week and last week. So, and that's, that's, that's not a bad thing. That's definitely a good thing. <laughs> bang. All right. Bang. That was terrible. Let's go on to, uh, the next part from the VIP lounge MVP announced three money in the bank qualifying matches for next week. We had Rey Mysterio against, uh, buddy Murphy, Alistair Black, versus Austin Theory, and Apollo Crews going against MVP. So I guess MVP still is slowly, you know, it seems like I guess those were rumors that his match, uh, the Raw after Royal Rumble, was his last one. And, um, you know, I, I, I he's going to be doing some wrestling too. I still don't think that this doesn't mean that the concept of him becoming a manager like he's talked about beforehand is not available because I think he's going to lose to Apo- against Apollo Crews. Uh, but who knows, but I was really happy to see MVP, uh, as a part of this. I like the matches that they have, um, with, with Murphy and, and Ray, I, I don't know who wins that. You would think Ray, but maybe Ray's going to put over buddy Murphy to help him out and he'll be av- able to have a, a great showing. I'm sure Ray Mysterio wouldn't mind just not being a part of a ladder match. Um, Alistair Black, I see he's going to win Austin Theory, but I feel like Based on how much offense he gave, he allowed uh, Apollo Cruz and Oni Lorkin, that it's probably going to be a very very good back and forth match. And anything Austin Theory can get, he was rushed up to the Raw. He's taking an advantage, and there's nothing wrong with it. Taking advantage of a really bad situation of of getting himself to just starting in NXT to now being a part of the Raw main roster, a part of an awesome stable, and having awesome matches uh, now with Aleister Black next week. So that's pretty cool. And then you have Apollo Crews, who it looks like they're trying to put more into an MVP. It could go either way. MVP is a staple when it comes to TLC matches. He's been a part of many of them. But Apollo Crews is a younger guy. So uh, still, some damn good matches, I think, uh, for uh, qualifications. Um, are you looking forward to these three matches next week, Chris? Yeah, I mean, all of those matches should be really, really great. I think Apollo Crews had a really good showing. I believe it was last week. I look forward to seeing him go against MVP. Um, I wonder if people are going to be upset that MVP is still there with everyone that just got released. I'm kind of wondering what the reaction to MVP is going to be uh, post the firings. But I I do look forward to that match. Austin Theory versus Aleister Black is probably going to steal the fucking show. I'm going to go ahead and put that out there. Um, oh, but, yeah. but yeah, I, all of these matches should be really, really good. And I'm glad that they're giving us some kind of build up to TLC and, uh, some sense of normalcy as far as how these pay-per-views are, should be built with, especially considering the way the stuff was recorded where, like where we had random announcers, not actually saying anything on the, on some of the other episodes leading to WrestleMania and after WrestleMania, um, so it looks like they cleaned some of that stuff up as well. Yeah, they, they really did. All right, so then we have the match, like like we've been saying, with Aleister Black and Oni Lorcan, and uh, fucking a pretty damn hard-hitting match. Oni Lorcan, like I'm not joking, it's kind of like a hardcore Holly type of concept. He's stiff as shit, he's tough as hell, but a lot of times he doesn't win. He's just usually there to make it look like a fucking badass fight you know, and and be credible in that aspect. Um, And uh, that's what happened in this. Although Orny Lurkin's voice does not sound as intimidating as, uh, as Bob Holly's. It's got that very weird high pitched goblin voice, but uh, these guys beat the living hell out of each other. And Alistair Black was able to get him with a black mass kick. But uh, yeah, I, I enjoy this match. I like Orny Lurkin. I don't ever see him getting too far and everything, but he's a good ancillary person to put in matches um, like many people. Uh, Chris, how'd you like this match with Aleister Black and Oni Lorcan? It's a great match. It's just so surprising that Oni Lorcan keeps showing up. <laughs> like, he is really, I think, the hardcore They're Holly. They're paying him peanuts. <laughs> the hardcore Holly uh, the hardcore Holly reference in comparison, I think, is spot on. I thought this was a very good match. Um, 
Tony Lorcan is just solid in ring, man. And uh, he had a solid outing here. And you know what? I will say this. I thought this was one of the better one of these Monday Night Raws. Mm -hmm. Um, Since, you know, as far as tapings go, I thought this one was a very easy to watch in comparison to some of the other ones that we've had previous weeks. Yep, I completely agree with you. All right, so the highlights of Becky Lynch's match against Shayna Baszler was shown at WrestleMania. And then uh, Becky Lynch cut a promo on Shayna Baszler and whoever wins the Money in the Bank contract. Um, You know, Becky being Becky. uh, Anything else besides that, really? No, I mean, outside that of, you know, what we've already talked about with my opinion on the match at WrestleMania itself. Uh, not not really anything to write home about here in this segment, and and I wasn't a huge fan of that match, so I was just kind of like, eh, during this part. <laughs> yep. Uh, we had another back or backstage interview with uh, Vega and Andrade. We cut a promo on McIntyre, you know, just alluding to the fact that Vega um, knows Andrade uh, will beat McIntyre because she's already led him to do that before in the past, and she was asked questions about other performers if she was worried about Austin Theory. Uh, going against Aleister Black. It's so funny because she's like talking about Aleister Black. Like me and Andrade know about Aleister Black too. I've already, you know, helped people against him. But that's her husband in real life. So just like putting over Austin Theory. And uh, yeah, um, we had the match after that, Chris, with Shayna Baszler and Sarah Logan. I thought this was really, I don't know, I thought it was really smart actually the way that they presented it. Because like I, I know a lot of people don't get Shayna Baszler. Uh, me and you usually are in the camp of, of thinking she's a fucking badass and a monster. But uh, I just love that she was asked. And we know what happened. We know what happened with the whole Ronda Rousey thing. And we won't get at get into it. I don't even know if it's a fucking work anymore. Christian convinced me in his uh, back and forth with Booker T that it's a fucking work. I don't know. I have no idea. Either way, we know that one person that kind of came to, kept to bat for her was Shayna Baszler before, you know, Ronda had her – second response to it um and uh she was asked uh, how she felt about ronda rousey's recent remarks about wrestling and that poor blonde um interviewer who looks so damn innocent i thought baszler was gonna headbutt her got right in her fucking face and then goes out and uh sarah logan uh defeated Shayna baszler by dq technically uh because baszler injured logan by stomping on her arm And the match was thrown out. Commentary discussed that it looks like the win should have been given to Baszler rather than Logan. I'm sure since Sarah Logan's now fired, that's how it's going to happen. Inside stuff, though, in real life, Sarah Logan and and Shayna Baszler are really good friends. Uh, They both trained together uh, when they both came first to NXT. I've seen them in documentaries talk about each other very positively, you know, uh, and Kind of sucks for Shayna that this is the display of, of, of her friend Sarah Logan that she did going out, basically. And I don't think we're going to see Logan again. But uh, I like the concept of making Shayna, she's pissed, throwing that stupid Ronda Rousey out. I don't even know if that was a, a shoot. You know what I'm saying? Like if they just told her to say that. But she seemed pissed off. She went out there. She completely destroyed Sarah Logan who's shown as being a tough chick before and then broke the the whole arm break gimmick and uh, just looked like a monster. So I'm assuming, do you think she's going to advance for TLC? I mean, yeah, I would say so. I feel like we're going to get, you know, I I would assume that she's probably going to win that TLC. Are they going to, how are they doing it this year's is, so I'm trying to remember the stipulation for this TLC match. Is Are they going to do like a four-way for the title? Is that the – maybe I missed this piece. I think they're just having a men's and a women's. Uh, I'm assuming four people, and then if they get the, the – you know, the, the briefcase, it doesn't matter what show it's on. They can cash in on whoever, uh, whoever's a champion is what I'm assuming at least. So is it TLC or Money in the Bank? Money in the bank. Oh, okay, okay. For some reason, I thought it was TLC. That that was. I could. Part I, of my... I might have said TLC. I'm I'm kind of dumb. So. Yeah. Okay. So all right. So that okay. That being said, yeah, I would assume that Shane is going to win the briefcase just because that's the match they have to go back to. I guess in the meantime, what the hell are they going to have Becky do? 
make pretty um, mediocre promos. Because, I mean, like, who is she going to wrestle at the pay-per-view? I don't that's, know. That's what I was getting at. So maybe maybe it is, like, Shayna doesn't actually in, in, enter this match and somehow ends up facing Becky again just so that they have a main event for uh, that pay-per-view. Well, what do they do with Sarah Logan since they fired her? Mm, that's a good question. <laughs> 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 that's a that's a good question. I mean, I guess you have to put her in the match now. I mean, fuck it. Do you just put does Becky just show up and say that she's going to defend the title in the match? That'd be pretty cool. Just I take the damn it. briefcase down. Just put the fucking championship up there. It was like, here's your opportunity right here. That would be cool. Something no one's ever done before. Yeah, I'm down for that. If WWE does that, I want credit for my idea though. <laughs> we'll make sure we'll make sure they they uh, they give you a check in the mail. I mean, that just um, makes the most sense just because I don't – there's no one else for her to face unless they go like – you know, like I don't know who else because I'm assuming they're going to throw Asuka into this fucking TLC match and like I don't, there's no one – they've built no one else for her to face. Yeah, I don't know, man. Ugh, so there's a lot of weirdness in that. I mean, think about the cruiserweight division. You have Leo Rush – and Drake Maverick that are part of that that contest, and they're not going to. We all we obviously know they're not going to win in advance. You know they have their three matches in the round robin tournament, and then that's it. Yeah, we definitely got some spoiler alerts yesterday before the before the yeah. NXT show. All right, so backstage. Oh my God, this shit. Seth Rollins said that Kevin Owens crucified his career at WrestleMania. Later on, he would say he wanted to assure the audience that he is still the Messiah. God damn it. It's like you completely shit the bed as a baby face. Not all of it was really your fault. Some of it was the position of where you were going. And then you go heel, which you are, I think, so much better at. And I'm a big Seth Rollins fan when it comes to his in-ring work. And this stuff sucks. I'm sorry. The, the Messiah shit. I just don't get it. He doesn't even have his, his people anymore. Um, I I don't even know why he's getting the fucking heavyweight title against Drew McIntyre or the, uh, the, the again the match. He just lost to Kevin Owens, but maybe it'll be a three way. We'll talk about that when we get there. But um, hey, Chris, how'd you like these wonderful uh, wonderful segments with the uh, Midnight <laughs> Messiah or whatever the fuck he's called? The Monday Night Messiah. Um. They do realize that you can have a name and it not mean that you have to actually be like make Jesus references every 10 seconds, right? Like your nickname can be the Monday Night Messiah, but you don't have to like get all preachy and shit. Um, hopefully, but yeah, I don't know. It sucks and I don't understand why he's getting a title match either. It would make no sense for the guy who just got his ass kicked by Kevin Owens to get a title shot. But, you know, this is the world we live in. I guess that's because they're going to somehow end up throwing Kevin Owens into the money in the bank match. Cause they need someone to fall off shit. <laughs> oh God. <sighs> All right. Then we had an awesome match with Austin theory and Akira Tozawa. Um, yeah, man. I mean, there was a lot of obviously disturbance cause Andrade theory and Angel Garza at one point beat up, uh, Tozawa after the match and did some, uh, Fist bump used by Las Cinco Bernables, uh over his body. Uh, that was kind of interesting, and Vega applauded them. But the match itself with Akira and Austin Theory, Akira is always a great wrestler. He definitely reminds me of Tajiri. Uh, the fact that he – like I've seen him in pictures with Tajiri, so I'm assuming maybe he got either trained or he's a big influence on him. He does the uh, octopus stretch, but he does it like, you know, not off the ropes uh, like Tajiri did, but – He's very, really efficient wrestler, good talent. They usually use him as a joke, and they at least allowed him to have a pretty good match with Austin Theory. I like good wrestling. Uh, and this progressed the story of Selena with her faction. Uh, how'd you like this match, Chris? thought it was great, man. Um, and I agree, man. They they had such a good thing with Akira Tozawa going, and then they just didn't really push the character, and it kind of just became the Neville uh the Neville show there for a long time. And then Akira just, you know, was on two Oh five live and 
And I think, you know, maybe if I watched 205 Live more consistently during that time period, I'd have a different feeling on him. But Akira Tozawa is a fucking, yeah, he's a phenomenal wrestler. His match was really, really good. But, yeah, I agree with all your sentiments on, on Akira there. All right, so we had a clip of Drew McIntyre from the WWE Chronicle that played, uh, the one that was talking about actually earlier uh, with him, you know, having the realization of what's going on uh, due to COVID and everything. Uh, Then we had Rey Mysterio who cut a promo backstage about Money in the Bank, how he's a veteran. He's been in so many ladder matches. He'll be able to get this no problem. Very confident. Um, Yeah, that's that's pretty much – that's about it. How'd you like either – well, how'd you like the Rey Mysterio promo? Do you think that he's going to advance, or do you think that he's going to put over Buddy Murphy? Hmm, man, I don't know. That's such a good question. I feel like maybe he'll put over Buddy Murphy here. I, I, it's a toss-up because I think you know having Ray Ray in the match would be great for the match itself, but having Buddy in the match would be great for the actual quality of the match. He's going to do way more than probably what Ray would be willing to do at this point in his career. Um, so I could see it either way. I mean, I don't know. That, that's a really good question, but I, I did like the promo Ray. Once again, he's just such a great fucking baby face. And it's like his promo work has gotten better over the years. Um, he's been great, especially if you go back to the feud he had with Brock, I thought all of his promo work there was great too. Yeah, I agree with you. One of the best baby faces of all time. And ugh, I don't think he ever went heel. I don't I don't believe. I could be wrong, though. Um, Angel Garza yeah, went against... It, 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 brief, briefly in WCW as part of the Filthy Animals once he lost his match. I guess that was kind of a heel faction. Oh, uh, yeah. But that yeah, would be he's the just, only time. But he's up, definitely someone that you can put up there with, like, Steamboat and Ricky Morton as, like, prominent baby face in the wrestling scheme of things you know yeah and like honestly you shouldn't count a lot of stuff wcw did <laughs> <laughs> let's just all remember hey what are you talking about bro let's take off his mask eric bischoff just grabbing it and ripping off his... anyways all right so we had angel garza uh he was one against tahuti miles and i i think tahuti actually might have been let go too i'm not 100 percent sure about that but new nxt recruit um Theory and Andrade entered the ring after the match. Uh, they and Garza beat up Miles and fist bumped again as Vega looked on. And uh, once again, just Angel Garza is fucking phenomenal, man. She's got three badass fucking wrestlers in this group between Angel Garza, Austin Theory, and of course Andrade Cien Amas. And Angel Garza, uh, Judy was great, uh, but just a good match and a good showing of Angel. What'd you think? Uh, my initial thought was the name Tahuti is n- you're not going to get over with that name in WWE. <laughs> that was my initial thought, but the match itself, I thought pineapple was pretty... Pete. like you have a better chance of getting over with pineapple Pete than Tahuti miles. Like, <laughs> like out of, out of all the names, I, it, I, so I don't know anything about this, this, uh, wrestler as far as like their background goes. Uh, is that their actual name? Or is this a gimmick name that they chose? Can we take a second to Google this? Yeah, it, I don't know. Uh, if you want to do that, you can definitely. I, I have no idea. I hope that he would have more common sense to not to name himself to Hootie. Um, so, no, that is his actual name. And he's known by his ring name was Elijah King. So out of all of the people they just keep like regular names for, I'm surprised they ran into this <laughs> one. <laughs> like, it's good. just i mean like you know hey, like here's another one though oni lorkin i like oni lorkin <laughs> why the fuck's his name oni lorkin <laughs> i don't know man there's some names that are going to be very very hard to get over with and i'm going to put tahuti miles up there as one as one of them yeah i agree with you all right so the kabuki warriors is a backstage interview and i mean it, it was just a lot of aggression in japanese and then the end of it Oscar said no one's ready for her. Um, and then backstage, Drew, Drew uh, McIntyre cut a promo on Andrade, kind of just signifying that he understands the past, but he has learned from his mistakes and he's going to beat Andrade uh, at the end of the night. And we had another qualifier matcher uh, with Nia Jax going against Kari Sane. 
And when I saw this match announced, Chris, I was like, really? Really? Of all fucking people, you're going to put Nia Jax with 102 – no, no, 96 pounds of Kari Sane for her second fucking ugh, match. But it actually wasn't that bad. Uh, I thought she was going to ragdoll her, basically. With the uh, Annihilator, which is – I believe that's – uh, Paige's move, I think, is what she did. And then a gorilla press into a Samoan drop. Um, Naya advanced, and Kari Sane, once again, is in the dust. What did you think? I'm confused on why Asuka wouldn't have helped more in this match. Are we just done? Is that tag team just done now, completely? I don't know. Looks like um, it's getting towards the end. Okay. So... Outside of that, I actually thought this was a pretty decent match for a Nia Jax match, and uh, I'm glad that Kerry came out unscathed. And it makes sense putting Nia. Nia is obviously going to be the monster in the Money in the Bank match. They like we talked about this previously. I think when we when we were looking at who they were potentially going to put in that tag team match in Mania, WWE likes to have one kind of hoss in there to for the smaller guys to fly around. Yep. All right, so Charlotte entered the ring and cut a promo about her NXT championship win, mentioning her upcoming title defense against Io Shirai. Um, She put over Io, and she also, um, I think on NXT, said that um, once she beats Io, (laughs) that the next person she wants to give a, what did she say, a coupon to or a, a ticket, a golden ticket to, is Mia Yim because they came up in NXT together originally. So that was kind of cool. Uh, it's now that I'm realizing this, it's kind of awesome with how, how amazing the women's division is in NXT that you have arguably the best. Well, it's kind of like Austin Carey Singer, both phenomenal too, but one of the best females in the, in the, uh, you know, Raw SmackDown roster, if you will, going to NXT to have all these awesome matches with their amazing women's division. Um, are you excited about her going against Io Shirai and then shortly after that, I'm, I'm assuming Mia, Mia Yim and just the women's division in general in NXT with, with Charlotte? Oh, I'm wondering if she's being overconfident and going to lose to Io. But yes, yeah, I, I'm I'm excited for, for that match. I think it'll be very good. I think Charlotte and Rhea's match at WrestleMania was probably the best actual wrestling match of both nights of Mania. Um so having more of that will, will be great. Now, I was surprised she won. And I think, you know, when me and you talked about it afterwards, it kind of makes sense with, I guess, Rhea is kind of stuck, right? Yep. So it, it, it in, in retrospect, it kind of makes sense. Now, that could mean that they could be holding the title on Charlotte for a while. Um, it does kind of suck for her to have to do. She'll be basically doing two shows it seems like, but that's, that's not a bad thing for NXT exposure. And I'm actually wondering if she, if, if some of this storyline is actually helping them in the ratings against AEW to some extent. Definitely could. All right. So uh, Bobby Lashley defeated no way Jose pretty easily. uh, That being no way Jose's last match. Uh, Lashley was distracted by Lana twice during the match and looked upset afterwards. I'm assuming this is going to end to their end. What I don't, I don't really give a fuck. But um, yeah, no way, Jose. Good luck, buddy. And uh, Bobby Lashley, very angry with his wife, Chris. Yeah. Uh, so this is kind of the end. I, I'm actually surprised that with this hat being, I, I mean, I guess because they want to get the storyline off. I, I would assume that Bobby Lashley is another potential person they might cut. Honestly, with the way that they yeah. booked him since that Rusev uh, Rusev angle, um, <laughs> another <laughs> I'm sure uh, Impact will be like, come on home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually, I mean, I wonder if they're if how that Lana stuff is going to shake out too. That's the other thing. Now that Rusev is completely gone from the roster, I'm wondering how that will shake out since they're they're seemingly killing the story. And once the story's done, they won't have anything for Lana to do or really for Lashley to do. Um, and yeah. she dyed her hair brown. She had everything going for her for being a blonde, but damn. <laughs> now Vince is like, who is this? 
<laughs> I can see you. I play John Cena. <laughs> uh, All right, so backstage, Seth Rollins told the camera, this is third fucking segment, by the way, just looking ominous, looking all pissed off, and then saying that he would stomp all doubt. And that was it. All right, so then we had the Viking Raiders going against Ricochet and Cedric Alexander. What a fucking awesome tag match. Um, All right, the downside, Viking Raiders won. Ricochet and Cedric Alexander have one win out of three matches so far as a tag team. But... (laughs) But, but they also, they were kicking the shit out of the Viking Raiders convincingly for a good portion of the match. It went back and forth. It was a good tag match. Uh, Ricochet and Cedric Alexander have worked on a bunch of uh, double moves, which I've been uh, impressed with. Uh, I really didn't expect the Viking Raiders to win this, honestly. I was kind of like, what? But, you know, that is one of their stronger tag teams. I like seeing good wrestlers be able to put on good matches, and Viking Raiders I mean, this is probably one of their better matches recently uh, since NXT. Uh, How did you like this match, Chris? Well, it was a good, it was a good match. I actually like Ricochet and Cedric Alexander as a team, but these are two guys that don't need to lose anymore. Nope. So if you don't want the Viking Raiders to lose against them, just don't put them in a fucking match with the Viking Raiders. It's easy. Just don't have that match. But so as far as the outcome goes, I hated it. As far as like the actual match itself and ring work, et cetera, I thought it was pretty good. Um, and I like Cedric Alexander and Ricochet as a tag team. It sucks that that's the only way they could figure out how to use those two guys. But, you know, if, if that's where they're going with it, they need to at least get some meaningful wins. Because, like, I mean, outside of the one win, like you said, in general, I can't remember the last time that Ricochet or Cedric won a match. Yeah, in general, that's very true. That's very, very true. Uh, sucks for Ricochet, especially, but we say it every week. Hey, you know what I was thinking? And maybe this is crazy of me, but when War Machine was in NXT, they had all the they, – they were doing very well. They were getting over the Viking concept to the audience. Then they were changed to the Viking experience when they came to Raw, and I think people just, just didn't get it, understandably. Then they changed their names, obviously, to the Viking Raiders. Um, the Viking thing hasn't really worked. There's been rumors that Vince, even though he's given them belts, obviously, he doesn't really get the Viking concept. During the same time period, Chris, uh, that Viking Raiders were doing their thing is when the Bludgeon Brothers started. I don't understand why Vince, if he wanted to present, I'm just saying, a change in a gimmick, towards wrestlers that already established, why didn't he try to do the New Age demolition with the Viking Raiders as opposed to trying to do that with Gallows and Anderson? This popped in my head the other day. Oh, you mean with uh, Harper and Rowan for the Bludgeon Brothers? Oh, yeah, not Gallows and Anderson. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know, man. They should have just left the damn thing named War Machine. No one really gave a shit about the Viking thing. The name War Machine is just a better name than Viking Experience. As far as, like, the actual gimmick itself, like, no one's buying into that they're actual Vikings. It's just now that you gave, you gave them a lamer name and then changed it and then just gave them squash matches. Like, that's the reason they're not over, not because you don't get the Viking gimmick. Yeah, no, it's it's true. It's a strange bird, man. All right, so we have the Street Profits and Bianca Belair talked about the Viking Raiders backstage with Bel- Belair telling the Raw Tag Team Champions to get more serious about their challengers. The only thing I had to take away from this interview is that Bianca Belair stole it. <laughs> she completely just looked like a bigger star compared to the two others. Um, but that might just be me. Uh, what did you think about this interview? No, I agree with you, and I'm still not a huge fan of her even being involved with whatever the hell this storyline is. It's a, it's a waste of someone that was like chasing for the NXT title to now just be involved in this. Yep. All right, and then we have the WWE champion going against the U.S. champion, uh, for, not for either belts, which is a weird concept. But Drew McIntyre went against Andrade. They had a damn good match. They even went over the spot – uh, that originally Andrade hurt Drew McIntyre with and replayed it. Um, I thought it was awesome match, but uh, Drew McIntyre defeated Andrade, pinning him with a Claymark kick. And after the match, 
Seth Rollins, Stomp McIntyre, stood over the WWE champion and then stomped the champion again to end the episode. What do you think about the match? What do you think about Mr. Rollins uh, putting his foot down as the next person to go against Drew McIntyre? But I'm, st- I'm surprised that Drew didn't just get right back up since <laughs> the curve <stopped laughs> no the shit. Thing. Yeah, no shit. Uh, he went through, what, four F5s? <laughs> yeah, like... You have to do more than a curb stomp, man. <laughs> Sorry, you killed the move. Um, no, I, the set thing is interesting. It just doesn't make sense to me, like we talked about earlier, because he just lost to Kevin Owens. Outside of yep. now, Drew. I mean, if you wanted to do this, you should have just had him attack Drew McIntyre, and then that you know set up the match, not have him call him out beforehand. So the call him out beforehand, and then basically announcing the match before the attack sequence ever happened i wonder if that comes down to the fact the show was recorded and maybe they just fucked up <laughs> you know what i mean like i don't yeah because <laughs> it just to me the the like it doesn't make sense that he would be getting a title match and outside of that as far as drew mcintyre and seth rollins having a match it'll probably be really fucking good yeah i'm wondering uh to close that monday night raw i'm wondering if the, the claim is Seth Rollins just pissed off Drew McIntyre. That's why they go into, you know, a program together. But is Kevin Owens going to come up and be like, I beat that motherfucker. I'm not saying three-way situations usually work out well when you're trying to go for the title against two other guys. But is there going to be a situation you think where it's going to be Drew McIntyre having to face both KO and Seth Rollins, not the same time necessarily, but within – like a three-way style feud, or they're just going to keep it between Seth and Drew and have Kevin do something else, even though he beat fucking Seth Rollins at WrestleMania. Well, I mean, I guess the question would be, what is Kevin? I mean, the only thing I could think that Kevin could do is win money in the bank. So you can ah. set, him up, set him up for down the line. Mm. But generally, yeah. you generally you want a heel to win money in the bank because it's a very heel-ass thing to do to cash in and when someone is getting their ass kicked. You know what I mean? Like the yep. only time faces win it, they lose. <laughs> so like John Cena, for instance, he like I'm gonna cash in in a normal match because I'm good guy John Cena, and then he just fucking loses. So like, uh, you have edge. It's like no, nope, I'm gonna do it this way. <laughs> yeah, I'm just a heel. Um, so that you know that that's a possibility is maybe that's where they're gonna go, and then you down the line because I my worry would be you just gave Kevin Owens a strong win, right? And then you're going to put him in a three-way with Drew McIntyre. Even if he doesn't take the pin, he's still going to take a loss. Yeah. They're not going to take the title off Drew. So if if they're just going to give Seth another raw loss and Seth is just going to be their kind of, I guess, their number one heel, then that's probably fine. I, I'm, the only thing is, is that that basically means that if Kevin Owens has anywhere on the card to be, it's going to be in that Money in the Bank match. So either he's going to win it or lose it. So either way, he's catching a loss. So... The top of their rosters is so weird once you pull Lesnar out. That's what I've said about (laughs) Monday Night Raw for so long. As soon as you take the title off of Lesnar and you put it on someone else, this is what happens. Because they don't don't have any (laughs) bills. Can we get Kevin Owens versus Brock Lesnar then? Hopefully. Maybe. That would be great. That's That's one of Kevin Owens' dreams and he still hasn't gotten that fucking match. No, nah, instead they fed him to Goldberg because that was better. Ugh. Uh, anyways, but yeah, I I agree with you. There is a scenario though where I could see where Kevin Owens comes out and quote unquote helps Drew McIntyre, gives a stunner to Seth Rollins. He falls out of the ring. Drew's like, "Thank you very much," and then gets a stunner himself to try to put him in the feud. But I could see them saying, "Fuck it, we'll do Kevin something else and just keep it straight with Seth." and Drew for right now, and let Drew have a good win over a top heel. Yeah, I mean, they could they could do that, or they could throw him in a three-way. Either way, it's like you're going to give Kevin Owens a loss after the strong win, just because of the way they set this thing up. Because I don't think they would give him the win in Money in the Bank, unless they're planning on turning him heel. So yeah, Probably I, I, not. But they could do something, let's say Buddy Murphy does win, you get Kevin Owens in there, you could do a feud between Kevin Owens and Buddy Murphy because that's still fresh and a little different, I guess. So there's there's things they could do. I don't I don't necessarily 
it, it's always weird to me that they decide to do Money in the Bank right after WrestleMania instead of trying to refresh some feuds and stuff uh, to build into those matches, like the individual pieces of those matches, kind of like they do with Rumble. You know, Rumble yeah. resolves a lot of, of feuds in itself by you eliminating that person or whatever. You could do the same thing with Money in the Bank, but it's always directly after Mania, so they don't have as much time to really put it together. I would almost move move it out before like survivor series or something. Yep. I could see that. All right, let's go to NXT. All right. So we start off NXT with Finn Balor going against Fabian Eichner. This is a fucking good match, man. Hard hitting Balor looked all fucked up on his chest afterwards, like hamburger meat. But, um, I I've seen Fabian Eichner a good bit. I like the dude. He's a strong wrestler. Um, he says, even though obviously he wasn't a part of the generation, just like I wasn't, um, he's from Italy, Italy, not just Pittsburgh looks at, or looked at at least Bruno, or Bruno San Martino as the ultimate wrestler. So he always wanted to get stronger, uh, more so than his size, um, as because of Bruno. So, uh, he is fucking strong as shit. You know, it, it's very misleading based on his size. I'm not saying he's not chiseled, but. Uh, good match. I loved, uh, when he, when Finn got Marcel Bartel, um, uh, took him out of the match by giving the shotgun drop kick, uh, into the railing, uh, and just took him out and then went after Fabian Eichner. And now he's been doing the coup de gras into the 1916 as a win. He's got, he's got all three now that he's beaten. And I think now it's him and Walter is going to be the thing once they can do that. I'm very confused, though, on the visa or, or traveling issues with the U.K. Are, it, does Marcel Bartel, Fabian Eichner, and, um, and Alexander Wolf live in the U.S.? I assume they lived in Europe, um, which the reason why that they can't do the match against um, Walter right now uh, is because Walter is over there and he can't get over here. And Finn lives here now. He's not actually in Ireland. So he can't get over there, and they've shut down the the UK NXT division. So very very confusing stuff. How did you like this match, and what do you think they're doing about Finn versus Walter? Obviously, they're positioning Finn against Velveteen Dream for right now. Yeah, I mean, I think that that in, to some extent that makes a lot of sense with with everything that's going on. But the end goal is definitely Finn versus Walter, right? So. Um, maybe he's just going to have to keep taking out the other members of Imperium and until they can actually do that match. Um, maybe the Trump sports justice league will be able to <laughs> get falter on a private jet or something. <laughs> uh, but outside of that, I, I, you know, it, that, I mean, it's a weird situation. I think putting him against Velveteen dream is not, you know, that's not, a bad idea. I think that's, that should be a pretty fun feud. And, and overall, this was a good Finn Balor match. Um, all of the guys in Imperium are, are pretty damn good, man. Like honestly. So this was, this is a good match and a good way to start the show. And I, I'm very excited for Walter versus Finn, just because I remember how good that Tyler Bate match was. And I think it would be, it's going to be similar. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm excited with him and Velveteen Dream. I think Velveteen Dream, it's it's an added layer. But Finn kind of had a reason to want to go against Adam, but Walter kind of fucked with him, and then he was like, "Screw this! I'm gonna take the UK title." So Velveteen Dream obviously has built it up. Did the same thing with Finn. That's Finn doing with Imperium. Finn's beaten Alexander Wolf. He's beaten Marcel Bartel. He's beaten uh, Fabian Eichner. Velveteen Dream. Beat Roderick Strong. He beat Kyle O'Reilly. He beat um, uh, Bobby Fish to get to the next person. So since we have Walter out of there, Finn's one of the people that should be going for that title against Adam Cole. Adam Cole beat his 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 record, and they're probably two of the most definitive champions in NXT. But now Velveteen Dream's probably going to be able to get an up over Finn, putting him even more into the picture against Adam Cole. So when he takes that title, he even has more of a reason since he just came back, but he's beaten so many people in a very quick time. And then once we can, we'll get Finn versus Walter for the UK title. And I would not be surprised if Finn takes that from him. Yeah, I, I think that that whole scenario makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's 
it's just so weird because they they have kind of built a great storyline there and obviously there's a monkey wrench there but what what you laid out i think would make probably the most sense that's the best thing i could think of doing um and either way either way i think we're gonna get you know we're gonna get some solid ass matches out of it so there's nothing really too bad to complain about i mean you know maybe this will be velveteen dreams kind of first big match back i want to say or at least like great match because i think finn should get him back up to speed because Velvet yes. Dream hasn't looked as impressive as he did before his injury uh since coming back so maybe this will be be the feud that kind of brings back that old velveteen dream in a lot of ways i agree um all right so in a video package charlotte flair talked about her career and her current nxt women's championship reign and she said after EO, like I said, uh, she wants to face Mia Yim as one of her first challengers because she respects her. They came up to NXT together. And uh, I thought that was really cool. I, Charlotte, uh, Chris, is not really playing the heel uh, necessarily. Maybe she will amp, amp it up like she does. But as of right now, it seems like she just wants to prove that she's a dominant women's wrestler with all these great female talents within NXT. Yeah. Um, is it? I mean, is it because EO is technically a heel? You think that's why they're kind of playing it like down the middle? Uh, yeah, that's a good point. But I, I mean, also, you know, to the to the NXT audience, I don't, you know, I, I it's such a weird thing because was Charlotte really a heel in the Rhea Ripley thing? If you think about it, didn't Rhea just show up and challenge her? Yeah. Is that how that feud kind of started out? Charlotte was just kind of I there. guess she's a prize fighter, you know, That's, kind of yes. neutral. She's just doing Kevin Owens' old gimmick? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. I'm fine with it because I think that these matches will be great. But, yeah, she is coming off very just kind of tweener. Like, no, I like, yeah, I'm here for good competition and stuff. But then at the same time, she'll be like, yeah, but then again, no one's going to beat me. And this is basically a golden ticket for their careers. So it's like... It's it's there it's definitely right like playing it right in the middle like a, a very shade of gray and maybe that has to do some with EO still being a heel I, I don't know. Yep, that's a good point. Uh, we had a match that kind of pissed me off with Zia Lee going against Aaliyah. So the premise is that Zia Lee accidentally broke Aaliyah's um, nose uh, in their first match. Um, and that's because she's way too fucking stiff and she doesn't know what the hell she's doing because she's injured other people beforehand. And, uh, yeah, so they were going to have a rematch, but Aaliyah took out Zia Lee beforehand. Uh, Aaliyah would get lose that match. I forgot who uh, sat in for her. And now they had another match where Zia Lee beat Aaliyah. I just – I feel bad for Aaliyah. She's been there, like I said, as long as Paige and Emma and fucking Bailey and shit. And uh, she's not bad in the ring. This – I just I don't know why you give an advance for Zia Lee. Like I said, I don't I, you know I'm just gonna call it. I think she's unsafe. I really do. I think she's way too fucking stiff and she doesn't know what she's doing. I've seen her kick people way too hard and that nose break was pretty goddamn bad with Aaliyah. So whatever. I don't know. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. I guess you have to have a Chinese female wrestler because the uh, you know it's it's more important to have some type of different concept than having a safe worker. Well, did she come out of the the performance center stuff that they set up with uh, with China when they had when Triple H was doing his like global crusade of building territories essentially? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I didn't pay this clo- the, the, that close of attention to the match uh, this this time. I, I know exactly what you're talking about in the past, especially that nose break. It was pretty brutal, but um, this match was kind of just there. And uh, it does kind of suck for Aaliyah because she's been there forever. But you know what? At the same time, she's still currently got a job. So that's that's yeah. good. <laughs> that's good, right? Even if she's taking losses to uh, Zia Lee. It's a good point. So then we had the NXT um, interim uh, Cruiserweight Championship tournament match. We had Akira Tozawa going against Isaiah Swerve Scott. Now, at first, you can say... Wow, I can't believe that Shane Strickland, Isaiah Swerve Scott was taken out, but this is going to be round robin. So they're going against each person to collect amount of points. 
um, very similar to – well, way larger, but very similar to um, New Japan's uh, – oh, god damn it, G1 tournament. G1. Yeah. So, But in a smaller sense, smaller brackets. So don't worry. Uh, Isaiah Swerve Scott's not out. But I thought the same thing kind of until I realized it because Akira just lost against Austin Theory. And they really haven't done anything to him besides being a, a good person to go against and usually lose matches. So I thought it was crazy that he beat him. But, hey, getting Akira a good win. They had a badass match. And um, Akira won with the senton from the top rope. After the match, Tozawa said he would become the Cruiserweight Championship champion again, I should say. Sorry. Um, How would you like the smash? I thought it was a... Uh... I thought it was a pretty good match. Kira Tozawa looked good both nights. Um, was a little surprised that Isaiah Swerve Scott lost. Um, but like you said, it is round robin. I don't think that they, I mean, maybe I just missed it, but I don't think they did a great job of getting that across originally when yeah. they were talking about they this did tournament. Um, but then once I realized that, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, it makes sense. So I was kind of in the same boat as, as you. I just thought this was going to be a straight tournament and this thing was going to be basically over in three or four weeks or whatever like kind of what they've done in the past with their cruiserweight tournaments. Um, but I like the idea of round Robin. I think it gives you cool matchups. Uh, I kind of wish they would have done more since pretty much all of their wrestlers kind of fall under two Oh five for the most part. You could have added even more people to this and made it even a bigger thing, kind of like G one, but you know, that's just nitpicking. Um, but yeah, I like the match. I thought it was pretty good outside of, like you said, uh, being kind of shocked by the finish at first and then realizing it was round robin, which, you know, partially my fault, partially their fault for not really driving that home. Yep. So then we had a video package for a participant in this interim uh, Cruiserweight Championship uh, tournament uh, for El Hilo del Fantasma. Very excited about him being in this. Uh, if Well, if you don't know Spanish, he's the son of the original Fantasma. Fantasma. Um, Really cool outfit. Uh, I've known this wrestler for a while through Impact and AAA, uh, but he's got like the Phantom kind of gear, uh, like his father did, and he's an awesome wrestler. Uh, if you were a fan of Lucha Underground, he was King Kierto on there. Uh, badass, fucking fast-paced wrestler. And one thing that's good for him, I would say, he can speak fluent English. You know, just because that translate doesn't work that well sometimes. Uh, but I think he's going to have a great career in NXT, and I'm looking forward to being a part of this tournament. Are you excited about El Hilo del Fantasma being involved in NXT and this Cruiserweight uh, Classic, Chris? I am, and it's a more so because they always seem to go directly to the main roster. So having him be part of this tournament with the Cruiserweights being involved and just be part of it in general i should say gives me a little more hope for for what they'll be able to do with this guy because i think he was phenomenal in lucha underground and, and pretty damn good from what i saw of him in the uh, in triple a and in an impact as you noted but uh yeah i'm looking forward to it i thought the video package made him look pretty fucking cool so we'll see what that first match is going to look like i guess yep forgot who he's going against but uh we'll find out soon uh, Tia Knox went against Raquel Gonzalez. Raquel Gonzalez obviously is the heavy for Dakota Kai. Screwed over Tia Knox not too long ago in a match between Kai and Knox. And uh, she got a win over her. Uh, so Dakota Kai interfered in the match, but Shotzi Blackheart fought her off. While Gonzalez was distracted by Blackheart, uh, Knox rolled her up to win the match. And um, yeah, just good to advance the story. Now Shotzi's kind of involved with this. I'm sure they're going to have some type of tag match. But um, good stuff. Uh, how'd you like this, Chris? Uh, I enjoyed it. It's, you know, obviously just continuing the feud with Tegan Knox and Dakota Kai, but adding Shotzi into it adds adds a little bit of a, a layer, like you said, probably giving us a tag match. And I thought the match itself was pretty decent up until the in- interference or um, or whatever. So. Yep. All right, so we had a video about Keith Lee's journey. Uh, to becoming a wrestler and making it where he is today. Um, apparently getting kicked out of his house for wanting to be a pro wrestler instead of trying to do what his parents uh, apparently wanted him to do with uh, playing sports um, and just putting his hard work into it. Um, I know Keith Lee has personally said, because uh, Keith was supposed to be in NXT in the original run, but he got um, taken out 
and uh, Dusty Rhodes came up to him, said he saw a lot of potential in him, said to keep on working on it, man, and uh, he gave him his number, and he was basically a mentor while Keith Lee was building himself on the road. Uh, cites Mark Henry as a big influence, cites uh, Macho Man Randy Savage as being the person that got him enthralled in wrestling. Keith loves fucking wrestling, and I am so happy that he's getting to the place that he's getting uh, from me seeing him a couple of years ago on the independent circuit. So good stuff. Uh, did you like this package, Chris? I did. I thought it was a good look at Keith Lee. Um, I think this is one thing that they they do a great job on NXT that maybe they don't do such a good job with on the main roster or even AEW yep. to some extent. I think they do a great job with these video packages and kind of telling you a little bit about who these wrestlers are. Um, and it's something I liked about AEW Dark, which they kind of went away from, which was the little sit-down segments with Cody. I wish they would bring that to the main show with Me some too. of their wrestlers. Um. But yeah, like I like this video package a lot, and I kind of wish more companies would utilize this method of telling you a little bit about the person, especially if they're pushing them as a big star. Yep. All right, so the next match was the mysterious Dexter Loomis going against Tahuti Miles, second night to have us make fun of your name. Uh, but hey, good showing, dude. He lost to Dexter, but a uh, very cool match. Uh he got um, submitted by the Anaconda Vice. Dexter Loomis, man, I don't know why I'm intrigued with weirdos, but I always am in wrestling. And this guy definitely checks off everything. Um, I know I forgot. I always forget what his name is. I think it's Sam Shaw. Uh, very much based this concept a lot, at least stylistically. He's a huge Jake the Snake Roberts fan. It's like if you take that and put a little bit of the creepiness of gold dust, that's what you get with this. And I think he's awesome, and I'm really intrigued of why he showed up during the main event and had a stare down with the Undisputed Era. Don't know where that's going, but um, cool stuff. How do you like the second match of Mr. Dexter Loomis? And, oh, and how do you like his uh, his like evil Stranger Things theme music? I actually like the theme music a lot. He kind of reminds me of the um, like the retired murder guy from uh running man you know the the blonde guy with the mustache for whatever reason yeah he kind of has that look to him for whatever reason to me so every time i see him that's what i think of you know the guy they call out of retirement basically to go try to be the final guy to take down arnold it, it doesn't work out for him but uh <laughs> long story short but for whatever reason his look kind of reminds me of that and then the mayor from street fighter 5 i can't think of his name right now it's slipping my head but yeah uh it's weird to, it's weird seeing uh, anaconda in a match throwing the cm punk submission on huh um but yeah no it's a good 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 match itself and uh he's an intriguing character and i kind of like the the look he has going so it it'll be interesting to see 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 how things pan out with him because they're also bringing in some other kind of mysterious characters and you still have the demon and there's stuff that they could do there and hopefully they don't jump the shark with some of that stuff but uh yeah, yeah they I need still... to keep they need to keep this guy and killer cross as far away from each other and let them develop by themselves Exactly. Don't try to put them together like two months in and then wonder why it didn't work. I still hate the name Dexter Loomis, though. I'm not going to lie. I love it. <laughs> but that's because I like Dexter Morgan, Dr. Loomis. I get it. But yeah, I don't I, I don't think it would work if he was just Dexter. I like I like both of those, too. I just don't want them combined into one wrestling name. <laughs> I gotcha. Yeah, it makes sense. All right, so Adam Cole was supposed to meet Velvet Team Dream for an interview personally. They kind of talked about this throughout the night. But he cut a promo on Dream from his house instead, being around his pool. He said no one deserves a shot for the NXT Championship and that the Undisputed Era will soon have all the gold again. Uh, and then in the PC, Velvet Team Dream cut a promo on Adam Cole, during which he called him uh, during which he called him possibly the greatest NXT champion of all time. Well, Finn Balor was not happy about that. He came out and entered and argued that he was actually the greatest NXT champion of all time and that ignorant comments will get you a date with the Prince. Dream told Balor 
to be a gentleman and pick him up on next Wednesday. So next Wednesday, we're getting Velveteen Dream versus Finn Balor. And even though I, he, a lot of people want Finn to be dominant, he has for so long, I think that he can give a loss to Velveteen Dream in this match. But it should be an awesome match. Loved the Adam Cole cocky segment, and I loved uh, Velveteen Dream's interaction with Finn. How'd you like this stuff, Chris? I mean, I I liked I liked the uh, promos that that uh, Adam cut. My worry is that they're just going to end up doing a screw finish and then a tag match, and then like we're not really going to get a Finn Velveteen match. But I'm hoping that's not the case because I think that'll be a really really good match, and I would like to see them maybe even flesh that out even more. But uh, it's it's also the undisputed error, so who knows? But uh, yeah, I thought the I, I like Dream's little segment where he uh, where he told Finn Balor to be a gentleman, <laughs> which I thought was pretty good. Um, be a gentleman, and pick me up next Wednesday night. Yeah, yeah, there was some good stuff <laughs> in there. Um, but yeah, no, it's I'm looking forward to that match. I'm just for whatever reason now that I'm thinking about it more, I have like a, a feeling in my gut that it's just gonna be a a fuck finish type deal. Yeah, and it's kind of played out, but I could see them doing, and they've done this before, because of Undisputed Era. You know, Adam Cole has them go out, beat the fuck out of both guys in the ring, and then William Regal comes out and goes, Adam Cole, because you did that, we're going to have you in a match with both Finn Bala and Velveteen Dream for the NXT Championship. So I wouldn't be surprised if that happened. Yeah, that seems like maybe they're that that could be where they're going, especially now that they're like like we were talking about, they may have to shift what they had plans had Finn planned to do. So yep. you know, if you if you have Finn pick up the title, right, then you can still do Velveteen and Finn or Adam Cole and Finn um, from or there. Even if even if they do a three way, you can have Finn have a good showing in the match and Velveteen Dream still pin Adam Cole, get the title, and it's still a three way match. Finn didn't really lose, and then he moves on for the UK title. And yeah. they do exactly what they wanted to do, you know, with Dream beating Adam Cole, anyways. Yeah, I could definitely see them going that route. Very interesting. Malcolm Bivens cut a promo on behalf of Indus Shear and then showed that both guys are actually pretty good on the mic and don't really need them. That's, that's what I thought from this interview. <laughs> I, I'm just, I, I've heard Shokley Hathaway is a great promo. I need to go back maybe and watch it myself. He just not has not impressed me as being the manager for these two monsters. Are you the same way or am I crazy? No, and this is kind of what we were getting at, what I was getting at the other day where you, where you were talking about Lance Archer. Uh, potentially talking on AEW since they can't get Jake the Snake. And I said, well, if he comes out and he's really good, then there's no need of, to have Jake at all, right, to some extent. <laughs> this is kind of yeah. what ha- that's kind of what happened with this guy, I, they think. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, there, there's something to be said about a manager that can do both, but, you know, with, with the way, like, for instance, Lance Archer's character, as soon as he talks, he doesn't really need jake anymore because of the because of the character type itself the same thing with like a monster tag team unit as soon as they start talking well then you don't really need you know the manager at that point unless it's just like lod or whatever yeah i agree all right so four matches were announced for next week's episode of nxt um I think the first three are part of the uh, the competition for the cruiserweight, but we have El Hiro Del Fantasma going against Jack Gallagher. If it is for that said tournament, I think Fantasma will go over. Kushida going against Tony Nice. Kushida would be the one I would assume would win. And Jake Atlas versus Drake Maverick. Drake said he has three matches, so I'm assuming he really has three matches, so um, Drake's probably going to go over Jake Atlas. I don't even know who the fuck Jake Atlas is. And then the Blackheart um, and Knox going against Gonzalez and Kai. What do you think about these matches, Chris? Yeah, I mean, those should all be really fun matches. I'm looking forward to probably the the, the Phantasma match and, and obviously uh, Kushida's match the most out of those. But it, that's pretty much going to be the whole show with probably like two segments. So at least they're letting us know what's happening ahead of time, you know? Yep, and I think that Finn and Dream will be next week as well, so that's that'll be a good NXT. Yeah. Um, before before the NXT Tag Championship match, Pete Dunn announced on screen 
that he had chosen Timothy Thatcher to be Matt Riddle's partner in his absence. Um, they kind of didn't really allude that Pete Dunn's not going to be a part of this. Obviously, we just know what's going on. He can't get over here. So let me just say, presenting before we even go in the match, if you really have a trio that's like three guys that you wouldn't want to fuck with in a fight, let it be Matt Riddle, Timothy Thatcher, and Pete Dunn. Holy shit. And the fact that they won makes me think they're keeping these guys together. So, uh, you know, obviously we don't know when Pete Dunn's going to come back over here, but uh, the concept of that being possibly a faction or a trio group, Chris, is that uh, is that a badass trio? Oh, totally. I mean, and the end goal is not to keep them as a tag team forever, right? I would think. Yeah. I mean, so – there's a lot of fun things you could do with this. And Timmy, Timothy Thatcher does fill that gap very well. If you need to pick someone that's not Pete Dunne, this was not a bad choice. So oh, let's see. He looks oh. like he's fucking in his 50s. <laughs> I don't know for sure. Uh, I will he's say 37. They, Jesus. Okay. I will say they beat the shit out of each other in this match, as most Bobby Fish and <laughs> matches go. Uh, this was great. I and and um i am very curious to see what you know loomis kind of after the match is just creepily stalking them or whatever i guess what the hell he was yeah. doing watching what is that and is 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 he coming after the king of bros i guess that's the real question right yeah it almost looked like he had more of a position against or he was staring at uh, roderick strong but uh whoever goes against him interesting stuff i love what they set up with loomis I like the fact that it was a hard hitting fucking match and I like Timothy Thatcher. He just, I don't know. Like I said, like there's something about him, uh, that's Benoit ish. There's something about him. That's, that's William Regal ish. There's something about him. That's fit Finley esque. Like he just looks like a mean fucking dude. And not only that, he looks like an old school, like old timey wrestler. Like you would see him in a match against, uh, Danny Hodge in the fucking, in, in the fifties or some shit, you know? Yeah, he definitely has that kind of look and, and grit to him, almost like a UK version of Minoru Suzuki or something. Um, yeah, holy shit. <laughs> but yeah, I, I thought this was good, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what they do with Loomis either way, because if the if the other idea is that Loomis is going to start taking out members of the Undisputed Era and that might be their separation, then I would also be cool with that. I think there's some yeah. cool stuff they can do with that character. And uh, this was probably my second favorite match of the week thus far. Yeah, it was a good match, man. All right, so that didn't end it there. I was like, they said something about Ciampa making an announcement against Gargano and, and of whether or not he was a better man and blah, 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 blah. And then we got it, but it was like the last couple minutes. And they're so smart. Like, NXT is now doing the thing where they show up the graphic and then something happens directly afterwards. Um and this is another situation. We had Tomas Ciampa saying that, you know, he, he has to admit, he goes, we're, we're done. We're not fighting anymore because I'm not going to even bring in the fact that, that, you know, you got involved with Candice and stuff like that. Basically, Johnny cheated. You fucking won. You're the better man. And that it looked like it was going to go after that. Now, now we have a horror movie scene that looked like, you know, one of those scenes where the camera gets tilted and you just see just chaos. Someone attacks the fuck out of 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 uh what you call of uh, Tomas Champa uh gives him a belly to back suplex you hear all this craziness then you see Tomas Champa kind of climb into frame and then get dragged out of frame really quickly and then you see the heels of Scarlett Bardot and Killer Cross and he comes up to Tomas Champa and says tick tock and that's it so i guess they weren't there for Johnny and uh and Candice we're going to have Killer Cross and Tommaso Ciampa, and I'm very, very excited about that fight because Cross is – he's scary, man. He's another one, and I'm looking forward to this feud. Uh, what, did you like the ending to NXT? I did. I mean it was a little hokey, but I, I like where they're going with uh, with Killer Cross versus Tommaso Ciampa because I, for some reason I feel like the end goal is to actually get Tommaso Ciampa up to the main roster at some yeah. point. So – you know, putting him against Killer Cross, you can give Killer Cross a really strong win, possibly, you know, sell the injury for Ciampa and then have him show up on the main roster later on down the road. So 
if that's the route they're going, I think that's very smart. And I did like the uh, the little TikTok promo. I think that was it was kind of fitting. It didn't. It felt less boogeyman ish as it did the first time they did, they had him in that video promo. I'm never going to be able to get the boogeyman stuff out of my head now, though. Uh, all right. AEW, I thought, had an awesome show as well. I really did. Uh, they started off uh, with the TNT Championship Tournament semifinals match. Uh, first was a promo for Mr. Jake the Snake Roberts talking up Lance Archer, who was going to be in this match against Colt Cabana. And, uh, you know, besides Colt's antics, I think that both me and you can do without. Colt actually showed he was a tough motherfucker, and Chris Jericho really. By the way, Chris Jericho, I don't want him to end anytime soon. Whenever he wants to end, if he wants to still do stuff in wrestling, he should really consider doing announcing. Uh, Cody was fine. Chris Jericho is fucking money. And I don't think it's just him and Tony Schiavone. I think he's good at it. Because even him as a heel, he's able to put over the baby faces, but still make the like still talk shit about them at the same time. So i very impressed uh, the last couple weeks. And him and Tony are fucking hilarious. Um but Lance Archer, Colt Cabana, they went back and forth for a good while, but Lance Archer finally defeated him. Um, like in previous weeks, Archer's match opened with pre-taped Jake Roberts promo. I already said that. Thank you, Up Rocks, for your breakdown. <laughs> but Archer won with the choke slam and then the blackout uh, against Colt Cabana. Um, how would you like this match, and how do you like uh, Jericho on commentary? Jericho on commentary has been great. Last week and this week, it's it's absolutely phenomenal. The shit he says is kind of is crazy. I still love the nickname Murderhawk for Lance Archer. That shit's awesome. Um, I thought this was a pretty damn good match. Cole Cabana is a great wrestler when he's just doing a straight wrestling match. I I still don't like the Superman pin that he does in NWA, but he's kind of gotten away from a lot of the other goofy stuff he does um, for the most part, and seems to be wrestling more serious based in AEW. Um, but this was a good little match. I, I enjoyed it, and it's looking more and more like Lance Archer is going to the finals for sure, um, which we kind of all thought. But yeah, Jericho and Shivani were hilarious all night long, and uh, I did really like the comedy that they were able to do while putting people over, and then when we got to our main event, we got a very serious tone Jim Ross, which I loved. I, I loved that yes. uh, the contrast between those things of here's the fun wrestling show to know this is they're they're seriously trying to kill each other which i thought they did a good job of of putting over in this show all right we had dr Britt baker who uh had a had a little uh promo and then she went against cassandra golden um i, I just love whenever tony just like mentions it like chris jericho is always like oh yeah you would know about her like you know just giving them shit uh if you watch the last being the elite there was another funny segment where she called him. It just they're, – they're having this whole concept where Tony, uh, who actually – one of the funny other things – I forgot what Tony's wife is, but they – him and um, – he has T-shirts for his wife uh, that, that Conrad made. And I forgot what they say, but he mentioned them when, like, Chris Jericho was like, it's not like you have any merch. And then he actually said that, and he's like, oh, now you're bringing up your wife. Like, you know, the fact that he's, <laughs> he's seen – he seems like he's enthralled with Britt Baker. I just think it's cute, man. I love Tony. Like you said, it's kind of mean genie, mean genius. But uh, Britt Baker won uh, after that that biting on the rope curb stomp that she's doing, uh, and she defeated uh, Cassandra Golden. How do you like Britt Baker? I think she's coming along so well as a heel. And how do you like uh, Smitten Tony Schiavone over I, Britt Baker? I love I love the Tony Schiavone like the Tony Schiavone Britt Baker kind of relationship is great i think that that's made actually has helped Britt baker in a lot in a lot of ways and kind of made the heel character work you know going back to those that first promo on the cruise ship with with tony to some extent um the the shit with the merch was hilarious because like when he he gave out the merch link and it was like something ridiculous i can't remember what it was (laughs) but yeah jericho's back and forth with tony all night was, was spot on um, the match itself was pretty good. I like the uh, the curb stomp, kind of her take on the curb stomp too. And you know, I, I want her to still use that submission, but I I like the I like the curb stomp as a like a secondary finisher. It was the uh, shirts that he has uh, that that Conrad made. That's Lois rules. It's like a Hulkamania a Hulk rules shirt in red with yellow, but it's his wife Lois rules. So 
that was the uh, that was the t-shirt. <laughs> oh God! I wonder if Lois just smacks him in the back of the head every time he comes home. <laughs> it's all it's not real. <laughs> it it's such a mean gene like thing though, because like all the ladies would always be around mean gene and like rub rub his like top of his head and shit. And it definitely there's a little bit of like something to this that has that feel to it. It makes me so happy, like very nostalgic feeling. Yeah. Uh, then we had an awesome segment. And this is the thing. It's like, I love the video package WWE puts together. They're great. But even if you got to deal with what you got to deal with, the inner circle had a conference call called the bubbly bunch uh, <laughs> where they made fun of the elite. And I love Sammy in this. I thought what he said was fucking hilarious, making fun of Matt Hardy and saying, yeah, he says I'm not even, a, or I don't even not speak Spanish. Like I'm, like, you know, just just the whole camaraderie and then Jack Hager with his kids both holding their ears so they don't hear him cursing and just going back and forth. With Chris Jericho. And uh, I loved it. I thought it was I thought it was fucking hilarious. The inner circle is great. My, All of them. My favorite thing about this. <laughs> like, what would you say? I'm why. sorry. I, we kind of missed you for the uh, what you liked about it. Oh, like my favorite thing about this is when Chris Jericho was in the kitchen pouring orange juice and just missed like the whole fucking cup, like and then just <laughs> yeah. continued on, like nothing happened. <laughs> I don't know why it made me laugh so hard, but it really did. I was like, he doesn't care. He's Chris Jericho. Um, I it was great. I like the name, the Bubbly Bunch. Uh, Sammy Guevara just like like curling the entire video with no <laughs> shirt on <laughs> bitching about matt hardy and darby allen shit's uh, fucking hilarious oh in jericho what was the great jericho quote probably has vanguard one spying on me right now that's what it was <laughs> <laughs> and then on commentary he was like talking about how vanguard stole his shirt that's what brought up the merch thing uh with that's Kelly right Steve, which was pretty damn funny all right, so we went into a match with Sammy Guevara perfectly going against Pineapple Pete, uh, a.k.a. Uh, Shug D. Um, and they had a good match, but I loved it that that uh, <laughs> Tony tried to refer to him as D. And like Chris Jericho's like, D, what the hell are you talking about? Now you're just going to shorten his name, just start calling him D? He's like, all right, all right, we'll go back to Pete. It's Pineapple Pete. Like, just hilarious <laughs> stuff the whole entire time. And this is a good match. Um D did great. Uh, Sammy Guevara, obviously, this was his match, but he won with uh, – it looked like a variation of, like, Feast Your Eyes. And after the match, Guevara cut a promo saying he beat the shit out of Darby Allen for the TNT Championship Tournament to advance and attacked uh, D until Allen made the save. Uh, good stuff all around, right? Yeah, Darby Allen – like, I like Darby Allen's kind of new look he's got going on, too. It's got you – know, to some extent here uh but I, I like it and i thought this match was very very good this is you know they've had some great and i know some of these guys have just came in and gotten squashed but the enhancement talent that they have kind of brought in uh with the limited roster and travel and stuff those guys have all been really good um yeah. so you know this was a pretty solid match i think you know sammy gave him probably a little more offense than needed but it was enjoyable to watch for and, sure and like you just said it like Thank you to not only AEW and then WWE, but also to the wrestlers that are already well known, like a Sammy Guevara or whoever over in WWE, to take the enhancement talent that they have to work with, whether it be smaller guys in NXT that are coming up or these wrestlers from Cody's and QT Marshall's school, to actually let them fucking wrestle and like allow them to show off themselves a bit and give us a little bit of exposure, even if they inevitably lose. You know, I think that's very good. Yeah, and Sammy Guevara is also a good person to do this against because he's he gets over cocky. That's part of his character. So yeah, it it played into the match very well. And uh, anyways, they might as well sign Pineapple Pete now because Dude, he's fucking just over. do it. Just do <laughs> like, it, man. Might as well. The guy got you himself fuck your over. Last name. Just fuck your fuck fuck Sid G or, or or D or whatever. Yeah, you're Pineapple Pete, and just just run with it. Maybe he'll get asked to join the inner circle. That'd be the greatest thing of all time. 
<laughs> what if it's like a fake out and they just beat the crap out of him? I'll, I'll be happy either way. That, yeah, that would be great too. <laughs> All right. Well, we had uh, Kip Sabian uh, going against uh, Tim Blake Nelson's son, Chuck Taylor. Um, in a match, was this for something? Wasn't this for advance for the uh, TNT Championship? Maybe it was. Maybe it wasn't. It's not listed here. But no, um, anyway, this was, just a, this was just a straight match. They're still going off that Penelope Ford versus Orange Cassidy feud, I guess. Well, either way, uh, Kip Sabian beat Chuck Taylor. I thought this was a good match. Um, Sabian won with a roll up after assistance from Penelope Ford with a jumping. Hurricane Rana off the top ropes, pretty damn cool. Uh, and also Jimmy Havoc getting involved. They are now kind of a unit because in real life they're best friends and they all live together. So uh, I like that they're kind of exploring that and keeping, you know, people. There's so many, doesn't necessarily have to be factions, but there's so many people that have other people within their group. It's good to have a couple guys in numbers uh, for that. But, um, yeah, this kind of more with Orange Cassidy. I love the shit where, where Penelope Ford got up on the uh, apron. And then she uh, took off her jacket and she was trying to distract uh, Chucky and he wouldn't have it. And then Orange Cassidy tried to do the same thing to Kip Sabian and everyone was kind of confused. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, just just funny, funny stuff. Uh, Chris Jericho in this match was, once again, fucking hilarious. I love that he was, she was, he was like, he was like uh, and this could come off creepy, but Chris Jericho was like, yeah, I like Penelope Ford's leather pants. She, and he's like, I wear leather pants. And Tony's like, yes, I know that you do. And he's like, I wore them in the jacuzzi last week in that video. You watched it. And he's like, yeah, yeah, you did, Chris. Like, <laughs> just awesome stuff. Just great. Um, but, yeah, Kip Sabian uh, beat uh, poor Chucky e. T. And now Tim Blake Nelson is going to be sad that his son lost. What you <laughs> I thought uh, I thought the match was fun. It was a good little breakup for in between the show. Yeah, be like a good middle of the show match. And uh, yeah, just overall thought it was pretty good. And I, I liked the definitely liked the Terry. Um, still not sure about what they're doing with Jimmy Havoc and Kip Sabian as a as a group. But if he's essentially going to be like Kip Sabian's crazy bodyguard or something. Yeah, and Sabian is just going to continue to be kind of a chicken shit heel that needs all the help he can get to win. Then you know that makes sense. That's fine with his character. I think that's a little better than than what we thought they were going to do because I I thought they were just going to have Penelope Penelope Ford just dump him this. Well, and not only that, you can kind of have Penelope branch off. It seems off. like maybe they are building. You know, yeah, you can be kind of branch off and do her own thing and allow um uh, what's his name to be there to help him out still. Yeah, and I mean, you could even, yeah. if they wanted to, they could start doing tag team stuff. That's the other thing. If they don't feel like Kip is working, they could put Jimmy and him together in a tag team. Yeah, that's a good point, too. Interesting stuff. Hey, uh, w. Dark. Yeah. Um, all right, so we had Sean Spears going against Justin Law. Another good match. Sean Spears gave this kid, Justin Law, a, a pretty good showing, and then Sean won with the C4. Uh, nothing too crazy, but this is to prep him because I think he has his qualifying match next week. I'm pretty sure. What do you think about this match, Chris? Yeah, another. Buddy, I think you're breaking yeah, up a bit. They're working with limited raw. Um, how about now? Now you're good. Okay. Sorry. I don't know what happened there. Um, you're good. Yeah, it's a it's a uh, this was a pretty decent match once again with enhancement talent, but they, you know made a good match out of it and uh i'm just i'm still i'm just not a sean spears fan i guess well at least peyton royce is good job sean uh, <laughs> next week's show is going to include darby allen going against sammy guevara and kip sabian against dustin rhodes within the tnt championship tournament uh, Kenny Omega will have a match, and Orange Cassidy will be going against Jimmy Havoc. That match really intrigues me for some reason. But if I'm going to predict, I don't know. There is a good chance. Everyone thinks Darby, it, it, it's going to end up being Lance Archer versus Darby Allen. I would not count Sammy Guevara out. He's lost before to Darby Allen. This could be the time where he fucks him over and causes him not to be able to be in the tournament to get the belt. I don't know. Kip Sabian, I see beating Dustin Rhodes, though. Um, probably with some tomfoolery. 
Uh, but Orange Cassidy and Jimmy Havoc and whoever Kenny goes against should be good stuff. What do you think about these matches for next week? Yeah, really looking forward to Darby Allen versus Sammy Guevara again. I assuming that maybe we get some inner circle interference in that one, and that might be how Sammy gets the the win overall. Um, so I, I I I don't really disagree with you there. I think maybe Sammy gets the gets his win here um, by hook or crook. And uh, for Kip Sabian and Dustin Rhodes, I think maybe Dustin Rhodes is going to win. Um. And kind of be like a either, you know, I, I don't know what that bracket looks like right offhand, but for whatever reason, I just have a feeling that he's still going to continue on. And uh, the, the the Kenny Omega, I don't know who Kenny Omega is facing, but I'm sure that'll be fun. And then, like you said, the, the Orange Cassidy versus Jimmy Havoc match could be a bazillion different things. It's going to be I'm very curious to see what, <laughs> that, what that's going to be like. <laughs> that's a good way of putting it. Oh, Lord. Um, yeah. Excited about everything. There is a chance that they might be positioning in the brackets to have Dustin go against Cody and have Cody have to beat his brother again to be able to advance. There is yeah, that. that's that's kind of what I was was thinking is that maybe you do brother versus brother again. Um, but I, it, maybe it's too soon for that. It's just they've only really given Kip one win and Dustin's. I think kind of currently currently has been had has more wins. I think people would rather see, you know, Cody versus Dustin again. Um, so I don't know. All right. So our last match, uh, Jr. was on commentary and it was a no holds barred empty arena match for the AEW World Heavyweight Champion, John Moxley, going against Jake Hager. And even though John Moxley won this match, Jake Hager is now on another level, I would say, after this match. Um, uh, Just, this was a fucking brawl. This was a great match. I watched it twice. It's kind of hard to pay attention to every detail with both things going on, and I'm not like Chris where I can have enough, enough, um, you know, uh, abilities, if you will, uh, sadly, to watch one and then the other. I like to watch both of them at the same time. So I went back and watched the match. It just, and this is the best one out of the three, but, regardless of Edge's stupid fucking comments to Corey Graves, that really pissed me off uh, because it wasn't like everyone in the wrestling community thought the match was too long and boring. But this one and then Ciampa versus Gargano and both those matches are just on a different level uh, compared to the fucking Edge and Randy Orton at WrestleMania match. I have to bring that up because all of them are the same type of concept. This was definitely by far my favorite out of the three. And Moxley and Hagar just beat the shit out of each other. John Moxley seems like someone you wouldn't want to fuck around with at a bar. And Hager is a legitimate badass, you know, uh, past uh, wrestler, you know, and also you have uh, MMA fighter, world heavyweight champion, WWE. Got a lot of credibility to his name. So, like I said, he might have lost to John Moxley, but I, I, I think this actually made him look good. And uh, Moxley retained the championship after a chair shot, followed by the paradigm shift on the chair. Haven't seen something like that in a while. Thought it was a really good ending. Um, I'll probably end up watching this match again. That's how good I thought it was. Uh, how'd you like this match, Chris? I thought this match was incredible, and Jim Ross on commentary added so much to it. It's exactly what I really, what I was hoping for out of the Orton and Randy, or the Randy Orton and Edge match, which is, hey, it's an empty arena, but you can still just have a fucking wrestling match, um, a no holds barred wrestling exactly. match. Exactly. And and this had very much shades of, you know, Terry Funk and, and Jerry Lawler. That's what I want out of that kind of match. That's what it should be. These two guys beat the shit out of each other. They had very little great wrestling moments, but they believably beat the shit out of each other. And you believed that Moxley was in trouble during parts of this match. Um, I love that he gave like he threw the chair. At that one, uh, the, 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 towards the end of the match, when he just fucking threw the chair at Jake Hager, because it totally reminded me of like a Sabu type moment. Um, Sabu used to do that shit all the time. Yeah. Um, there was just a lot of really good spots, and I like that you know Moxley went over clean, and I liked his promo at the very end of it. Yeah, I, I don't remember the per, the promo so much, but John Mox is a badass. This definitely raises socks. I thought he was getting a little bit stale, honestly, but. Um, 
good stuff all around. I wonder who do you think's next for uh, Mr. John Moxley, championship wise? Man, well, the 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 thought would be Jericho, right? Jericho rematch. But he's right now, and then yeah. Kenny's already Kenny's already lost to him, um, and I don't think he's high enough in the rankings. Anyways, Cody, I don't think so, because obviously he can't win the championship belt. Then there's MJF, I guess, you know, possibly. That yeah. MJF actually makes a lot of sense. Hmm. I wonder he, if, yeah, MJF might work. I wonder if maybe they would go with, oh, I, I'm assuming that Cody's going to win the title, right, for, uh, in this tournament, either him or Lance Archer, and that's going to be a feud for a while. So, yeah, it is, yeah. Uh, I mean, Matt Hardy, maybe? Possibly. Maybe uh, maybe Brian Cage will finally show up and beat the shit out of him. Yeah. Hmm. He's still I don't know. injured, actually. I don't think that's true. <sighs> I mean, you could, I mean, with Moxley, he could just continue fighting people from the inner circle for forever until they find him a new opponent, I guess. What, <laughs> would it be cool if maybe Moxley, for the next couple of weeks, did like the open title thing where he's like, whoever wants to fucking come out, and they just give him Luchasaurus one week, or they give him whoever, and he beats all of them, but it's not like necessarily a feud. Kind of like what John Cena used to do with the U.S. title. Well, he kind of did that one week after the Kenny match where he challenged kind of anyone that thought they were crazy enough to fight him. You you remember that? And then he – I think he had a match with Janela again. Yeah. Jimmy Havoc's another person that would be kind of cool in a hardcore match. Probably take him to his limit. There's a lot of good people. Pentagon – Okay. Who was that that just came back and that hasn't really been on since? Uh, God, what did, I can't think of his name. It's escaping me right now. Man, why can't I think of this? He was in uh, New Japan recently. Showed up on Jeff Impact. Cobb? Yeah. So what's happening yeah. with him? I don't know. Because he had that little mix-up with Moxley and then... Well, I mean, obviously all this stuff happened, so we don't really know, but I'm assuming that maybe they could go back to that. That would be fucking awesome. Yep. Whoever it is, I'm sure they're going to have some great matches. But um, before we get out of here, Chris, let's talk about the ratings. Um, so, according to Figure Four Online's Brian Alvarez, NXT... Uh, garnered 692,000 viewers doing its broadcast on USA on Wednesday, while Dynamite averaged 683,000 dollars, 683,000 viewers on TNT. Um, their numbers were like last week; it was like neck and neck. This week, they're a little bit higher, but both shows are significantly down. Both, uh, especially AW, was headed towards a million before the epidemic and everything. So, you know, good stuff. It's kind of like winning by default, but hey, NXT's got two weeks, and I think that both shows have been pretty fucking awesome and show why Wednesday night is the night to watch wrestling, regardless if it's NXT or AEW. It's just fucking good and better than anything else. I, I mean, I, I wonder what this really attests to, though, because is it do you think it's just people are just burned out on watching stuff because they're having know. to be at home all day? Because or you, you would it, think it would be the opposite. Are, it might be because people are taken back by the fact that there's no audience and it just like like people that are more casual, I guess, are just like, fuck it. I'll just wait until it gets back to normal. Yeah, that's what I, mean, I would it, assume. Yeah, that might be a good point. I, I, it's just my my thought on it would be like, where where did the where did they go? Like, what else are you watching though? <laughs> yeah, good point. I don't you know. know. I mean? um, where but, do you go, my lovely? <laughs> I mean, it's it's not just uh, these two shows either. Raw was down below two million. It's the lowest that they've had, and uh, they hit the lowest they've ever had this week. So. It, it, the ratings were affected across the board. It wasn't just, you know, AEW or NXT it is across the board. So I know, like, one of the things Alvarez was talking about is basically. 
Bucks will always be like your core WWE audience. He thinks that mm-hmm. that kind of looks like what, like regardless of how bad it gets, that's like the core built-in audience is probably around 2 million, <laughs> like 1.9. So that was an interesting conversation with him and Dave Meltzer. So if you guys get a chance, go check that out because it was, uh, Dave was saying it could obviously get lo- way lower, but I, I don't, I think I, I kind of, tend to agree here where it seems like it's probably going to be around one point or point uh, 1.8 1.9 and then uh with aw and nxt it's going to be towards their lower rated shows around seven hundred thousand for both of those shows unless you know something crazy happened i can't believe more people didn't tune in for this moxley uh jack hager match I'm, i i don't have i didn't see the quarterly hours i wonder if it actually went up during that quarter um, when that match I wonder if they advertised enough for that, you know? That's a good point. I mean, they definitely talked about it on last week's show, but then, then again, only 600,000 people or whatever watched last week's show. So. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's kind of... It's, it's, it's weird. I mean, I think that AEW has done a lot better job with the no crowd thing as far as it not being as noticeable. And a lot of that to me has to do with Jericho on commentary and some of the things that they've been able to do on commentary that, that kind of gives you an extra distraction away from that um, to some extent and, and just sprinkling in, you know, random wrestlers like pineapple Pete, for instance. Yep. Well, either way, I'm glad it's here for our entertainment. Um, as long as they're staying as safe as they possibly can. Hey, Wrestling is now an essential business in Florida, so <laughs> ex- expect – hey, this is no joke. Uh, expect some other wrestling organizations like we are talking about that have been trying to start things up to possibly do that again. Impact's had a very good relationship with Orlando, Florida. You know, I don't know about Ring of Honor. Uh, I don't know about NWA, but – Definitely AEW and WWE, while that's going on, will stay afloat because of this. And next week, we're going to be getting WWE live uh, with their shows again. Crazy stuff, Chris. Any closing yeah. statements? No, I mean, I, I would just assume that this, if, if WWE was able to get this done, AEW would be able to get this done as well, especially because the NFL commissioner is part of this group. So, in theory, with Tony Khan... And uh, or the cons in general owning yeah. the Jacksonville Jaguars and being such a big part in Florida, I'm assuming the AEW will be able to tape again in Florida because they had to move their tapings to Georgia beforehand. Yep. So all the stuff that we're seeing now was taped here. So wrestling's essential though. It's it's, important. <laughs> it's like food. <laughs> yeah, you can't say it's essential for one company and not the other one though when they're both based out of Florida. Oh yeah. There's no way. <laughs> that's the that's the caveat, I guess. Well, it, it will be interesting to see what comes back, um, how much more new live stuff we have. As long as everyone's being safe, I guess uh, it's good for us to be able to have entertainment. But uh, I think this has been another episode of Wrestling Geeks Alliance. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, we appreciate all the listens that we get. Uh, we'll be uh, back probably Saturday to talk about SmackDown and whatever – thing pops up um actually if it's just smackdown there might be a good chance that you won't hear from us until next week but uh (laughs) maybe we'll we'll try to figure out some cool stuff um you know there's plenty of things that we can do we can go back to the hall of fames and add some more tag team people or uh you know just talk about some wrestling maybe maybe me and chris will do a watch along after we talk about smackdown we'll figure it out we're here for your entertainment that's the whole entire point so uh chris Uh, tell them any uh, information you want to tell them and uh, say goodbye to the lovely people. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for listening as always. And you can hit me at, at Chris R Patton on Twitter and Christopher dot R dot Patton on Facebook. Uh, The latest episode of skates to throats is posted. So if you're a hockey fan, go check that out. And uh, as always, thanks for listening and you guys be safe and uh, I'll pass it back to you, Dane. Thank you. And also if you guys want to get hold of me, I'm on Twitter at Dane 42. Just hit me up. And uh, definitely uh, Facebook at Dane Alves if you want to join Geek Vibes Nation, which is the larger company that we are part of. And join the conversation on those media, um, social media platforms. Uh, just look up Geek Vibes Nation on either Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and go to geekvibesnation.com for news information about wrestling, comic books, pretty much everything geek-related we cover. 
So uh, thank you guys so much. Have a wonderful evening. Please be safe and let the Geek Fives be with you. Peace out, guys.